Welcome to the Foul Play YouTube channel, Reading with the Crew. Thank you so much, Jack61, and uh, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone on the panel and welcome everyone in chat. It's fantastic to see you all here. Um, we're going to be continuing with the, the Reading with the Crew series, as Jack61 said. And uh, believe it or not, we're on episode number 25. Uh, and I just want to say, everyone from the Foul Play team, uh, wow. Uh, last week's episode was really well received. Um, a lot of got a lot of questions about the dogs, uh, the canines that we used uh, in this case, uh, and we'll be continuing this today. Um, there's a lot of information, and it's likely we're going to do this over another two, maybe three more episodes. I didn't really realize um, how important the canines were that we used on the Avery Salvage Yard. Um, and as Jack 61's, uh, if you can see his picture behind him, it really all was about Cuss Road. There's no question about it. Uh, and uh, so today we're gonna really deep dive uh, and look at a lot of documents uh, and testimony, um, as well as continue reading the chapter. So if you've got the book, uh, John Farrakh's book, uh, The Wrecking Crew, it really is an excellent book, um, especially if you're very new to the case. It does cover the Stephen Avery case, predominantly the Stephen Avery case in a lot of detail. But what I felt was that he didn't really cover the canines uh, in a lot of detail. He sort of like skimmed a little bit. But um, as a consequence of uh, starting the chapter, uh, both Nevely and I uh, did some additional research, <laughs> Jack61 will point it out, and um, we've got a lot of more stuff for you guys. So today's going to be a real cracker. So hold on to your seats, guys. It's going to be a ripper. Uh, well, look, guys, again, a fantastic warm welcome to all my Steam panel members. Fantastic to be here. And uh, unfortunately, Nevely can't make it. Um, She's got certain things on today and uh, for a couple of more days and uh, we wish her her well and her son is in the military. Uh, he's come back home, which is awesome. Uh, so guys, if you like what we do, uh, please subscribe. And I think Jack61 will tell us that our subscriber numbers are increasing, which is fantastic. And it, it really warms our heart that you guys are supporting us. Uh, if you like what we do, please give us a thumbs up. Uh, the algorithm really works in our favor, the more likes that we get. And so the interesting thing is that um, we're starting to appear on a lot of uh, YouTube sites, uh, websites, the Foul Play team, which is awesome. So guys, if you enjoy what we do, uh, please share. Share the love. Tell other people about us and, uh, you know, we're trying to spread the message, which is awesome. So guys, um, I just want to say that even though we're presenting this information from John Farrakh's book, it really represents his ideas. So the important thing is this, uh, make sure that you do your own research, and I'm sure everyone here on the panel will agree, and come up with your own conclusions. That's very important. But what you realize is that, especially when you see this episode here, we definitely deep dive into the documents, right? Uh, we don't just look at what MAM1, what's in MAM1 and MAM2. We really deep dive. We go to the root documents. And this chapter has really opened my eyes in terms of the shenanigans that were played out. And I'll also prove to you that Stephen Avery was doomed from day one, okay? And there's a couple of gold nuggets and embedded confessions that you'll see um, very, very early on. You know, we're talking about, you know, was there a funnel vision? Was everyone looked at equally? And the answer, of course, is no, right? The, the spotlight was focused on Stephen Avery from day one, as you'll see. But it's very interesting that the canines were telling a different story, a story that the state did not want to talk about, right? Okay, well, look, guys, I'm not going to waste too much time. 
The only thing that I would like to say, apart from welcome everyone that's in chat, we've got a lot of people already, which is awesome, is that please be respectful for one another. Uh, make sure that you put your questions down and we'll try and answer them as best that we can uh, during the show. And uh, sometimes, as I've always said before, and I'm sure everyone will agree, we sometimes get Barb appearing in chat, a family member. So please be respectful to her because it would not have been easy and it still is not easy for her and her family, remembering that both her son and her brother uh, are in prison you know, and they've been in prison for a very long time. Here at the Foul Play team, we're not scared to get to the truth, no matter where the chips may fall. Right, guys? So that's the important thing. Well, look, I don't want to waste too much time here because there's a lot to cover. I'd like to introduce our panel members, starting off with Jack61. Jack61, how are things coming along? Doing very well. Thanks, Doc. Hello to my panel, panel members and everyone that's joined us in live chat. Looks like we've got several that are continuing to roll in. And I uh, also want to mention our brand newest, Shiny Mod. Jazz oh. <laughs> Jazz Jazz He's been around a That's long it. time and he's very case knowledgeable. He's always helpful. Uh, everything I've ever seen is just a gentleman. So we're glad to have him and glad he accepted the, the mod position. So anyway, Fantastic. yeah, with that said, uh, yeah, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, and as Doc said, uh, <laughs> he sent me a pile of new slides. We've got a lot. Yeah, I just don't think there's any way we can get through it. I, mean, I think we're going to be at least two, if not three more, in the series covering the dogs because it, there's so much. And then, yes, our numbers have increased uh, again. We're above 2240, I think. And also, another milestone, our, our videos on the channel have have been viewed over 900,000 times. And for us, you know, as a, a small truther community, you know, really geared towards these two cases, but others as well. It means a lot to me. I know it does to you and everyone here. You know, it's... Uh, it, uh, you know, it, it's awesome, Jack61, and uh, that's a credit to you and everyone on the panel and other members um, who don't appear on the YouTube uh, 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 lives. There's a lot of work that gets done behind the scenes. And uh, I'm thinking about Brother Lewis, uh, Zoe, uh, who put a lot of time, energy, and effort uh, into the website, uh, putting up the documents. The fact that our channel uh, four years ago didn't even exist, we had zero views, to now over 900,000 views, uh, means that um, the community trusts our work. Uh, they're very interested in our work. Um, and they can see the quality, the time, energy, and effort that everyone puts in. Um, and I think we've got a very balanced team. We don't all agree with each other, right? No. Nope. And we have incredible, fruitful discussions, and they're all complementary. And uh, oh, I can't wait till we reach a million views, and that, that's a credit to the team. And I'm, I'm glad to be a small part of it, which is awesome. Same here. You know, and I think about... Of this last batch of calls that we got uh, with Jody, and there's about, I think there's about 50 videos that I made and uploaded. And, uh, you know, that, I was doing, I wasn't just doing that. I had other tasks and stuff that I was working on, but I considered that. And you think about what Zoe did way back, almost 1,500 1, jail calls that she put up. 1,500. Yeah. Massive. Massive. And it's a it goes huge to show, body, huge body of work. Yeah, it goes to show that um, even though we're doing the content creation, there's so many people behind the scenes That's right. to put it all together to make sure that the machine is well oiled. Yeah. And it's a it's a credit to everyone, everyone on the panel, everyone behind the scenes. And it goes to show that a team approach is the right approach. Absolutely, because not one person can do absolutely everything. You know, most of oh, a few of us are retired and even we're putting in a lot of hours, right? So you could imagine one person trying to do everything is just about mm. impossible. No but way. A team approach is a balanced approach, I think. Thank you, Jack61. Uh, yep. Any additional comments? No, 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 no. Uh, no, we're good. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Jack61. Uh, next, we have Alice. Alice, how are you coming along? <laughs> hi, hi, Doc. Hi, everyone in chat. Uh, not so good tonight. Um, I had a few dental procedures this week, so my mouth is a bit swollen and a bit sore. So um, I'll see how the pain goes throughout the night. Might be on till the end. I might have to just slip away. But it's Understood. great to be back on the panel. And hello to everyone in chat. Welcome and thank you so much, Alice. Great to see you here. Next we have, I don't recall. How are you coming along? I'm doing well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Reading with the Crew. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you here. And next we have Susan. Susan, how are you? I'm good, Doc. Thanks. Hello and hello, panel. Hello, chatters. Hello, lurkers. Uh, looking forward to today's podcast. And uh, I'm so excited because I have a brand new laptop and I have an actual keyboard now. So, what? Oh my God, it's Must amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank uh, you so much, Susan. Good yeah. to see you here. And finally, we have just Rhonda. Just Rhonda. Hello, Doc. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody on the panel and to everyone in chat. And thank you all for being here. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Just Rhonda. Uh, and I, I just want to say that I caught your last podcast about the reading, the closing statement. Oh, my God. It's bad. Yeah. And um, I heard that um, you want to invite me to uh, the uh, closing yes. statement. Um, about uh, to explain if there's anything on the DNA. I'll, I'll love to be there. I'll love okay. to be there. Great, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, awesome. I hadn't extended that yet. So whoever did, I am grateful to you for doing that. I've been Fantastic. kind of... We'll, we'll sort out the details stuff, later so. on. Yeah, yep. yeah, you bet. Fantastic. Okay, yeah, thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Uh, no problems at all. And I'd like to welcome everyone in chat. There's a lot of people in chat. Um, who would... Uh, Susan, would you like to call out who's in chat at the moment? We've got quite a lot of people. Sure, Doc. Let's see. Let me go back to the top here. We've got JD. Uh, Katie did it. Welcome. Uh, let's see. Ronald Lee Cass is here. Awesome. Uh, the lovely Gloria Glanetsky. Um, Andy B. Uh, let's see. TJ is Laura King, of course. TJ. Yes. The beautiful dark side. Uh, let's see, Jazz Naz is joining us in chat. Awesome. Sherry Lynn Pontillo. Let's see, Cher is with us. Fantastic. Hello, Cher. Catnet, of course. Audra M. Mark Kaz. Welcome. Rumor has it. Welcome, welcome. Let's see. Dan's Life 7 is with us. Our William has joined us. Hello, William. Yes, welcome. Colette M. Hello, Colette. Pete Moss. Hello, Pete. <laughs> Pete's here. Let's see. I think I've got everyone. If I've missed you, I'm sorry. Yeah. Say hey and we'll shout out. <laughs> did you get Gloria, Susan? I did. Duke Juke oh. 11 is here. Duke 11? That's a new awesome. name to me. Yes. Welcome, Duke yes. Juke. We got our William as well. Yes. Awesome. All right, guys, and of course, a big warm welcome to all our mods and super mods. Great that you're all here. Um, well, look, guys, we'll make we'll make a start unless there's any other uh, comments. We're all good. We're all good. Yes, excellent. I believe um, so. Okay, and Jack sixty one has got the first slide up, and of course, guys, we do this um, for the memory of Teresa Horbach, who was uh, tragically taken 
at a very tender age of 25 years old. Um, and we believe that um, she was murdered on October the 31st, 2005, although there's no real hard proof. Uh, but um, that's exactly what we're trying to do here, guys, to reach the truth, to find the truth, no matter where the chips may lie. Um, and so we do this for the memory of Teresa Horbach and her family. And here on the panel, and I'm sure a lot of members in chat, Brendan Dassey, who were uh, charged and convicted of her uh, brutal, brutal murder. And guys, as you've seen through the Reading with the Crew series, and also other podcasts, Open Mic as well, uh, we've shown that the state's case is complete garbage. And uh, hopefully that, guys, by the end of this podcast, uh, you'll see that the shenanigans that, that took place. Um, and guys, as a warning, I'm not sure whether Jack61 has got the picture or not, but uh, the harsh language warning, um, please, guys, sometimes we, we do get passionate and sometimes the occasional harsh word will come out. Um, please forgive us. Uh, we don't do it to be intentional, but sometimes uh, we get badly triggered, right, guys? So we'll try our best uh, not to use harsh language, but sometimes it happens. All right. Uh, unless there's anything else, Jack61, can we start with the very first slide? Uh, yep. And that's slide 10B1. Yep. Give me just one sec. Yep. No hassles at all. So, uh, like I said, guys, um, I've got a lot of questions regarding the dogs, the canines that were used, uh, and how how come their uh, olfactory system is so, so powerful? How come their sense of smell is so good? So, guys, what I'll do, um, we're going to just talk briefly about the dogs that were used on the Avery Salvaged Yard and also uh, surrounding properties. And uh, this beautiful dog here, uh, is an example of what is known as a cadaver dog. And uh, the important thing about cadaver dogs is that they are trained over many, many years, okay? It's not a six months course, right? To be regarded as a top-notch, top-tier cadaver dog, uh, it could take up to eight to 10 years of training. Now, uh, cadaver dogs, for example, brooders, Brutus was an example of a cadaver dog that was used. They detect human decomposition. So that's very, very important. These canines are not specific for a specific individual. They detect general human decomposition, whether that's blood, tissue, hair, bone, uh, you name it. They're non-specific but they detect the scent of human decomposition. And what is important here, guys, is that these canines are trained specifically to detect human decomposition, not animal, right? So they undergo extensive training and they pick up the scent of death, decay, decomposition. And I'll tell you what, uh, as you'll see, and as you've seen uh, in episode number one of this particular chapter. And by the way, guys, we're on chapter 14 uh, of John Farrakh's book, if you're following it, uh, called Canine Noses. So these uh, beautiful canines are trained over a long period of time, and they certainly were brought in to the Avery Salvage Yard, right? So Brutus is an example of a cadaver dog. Uh, Jack61, can we have the next slide, please? Now, apart from uh, the cadaver dogs, there was also another type of dog that was brought into the Avery Salvage Yard. Uh, and this beautiful creature here uh, is a bloodhound. And bloodhounds are very, very different, right? Now, bloodhounds are known as live scent dogs. So basically, they are sniffer dogs. But the important thing is, they can be scented with the scent of a specific individual. Now, this is important because cadaver dogs 
are non-specific. I really couldn't believe it, but when we die, when we are dying, we all smell the same, which is amazing. We all smell the same. We produce the same biochemical breakdown products that a cadaver dog detects. A bloodhound, for example, Loof, uh, and Loof was brought onto the Avery Salvage Yard, they are scented. So they're given a specific uh, item of clothing uh, and they are scented for a specific individual. And in this case, a Loof was scented with the scent of Teresa Horbach. So Loof was tracking her scent throughout the Avery Salvage Yard and around the salvage yard. So the investigators did the right thing, right guys? They brought in cadaver dogs, they brought in bloodhounds. So these uh, canines were searching on the Avery Salvage Yard and the buildings, but their noses led them to outside the salvage yard, which caused a lot of problems, right? So the investigators did the right thing. They brought in the canines. Now, Jack61, can we have the next slide, please? So the, the question is, what makes these canines so good? And you're looking at it right now. Uh, their nose is what makes them so good. It's so-called the power of the canine nose. Uh, and you compare your nose to the nose of a canine, forget it, <laughs> absolutely forget it. But have a look at the nose of one of these canines. You can see the structure of the nostrils, and that's crucial. The way the dog's nose is constructed is very, very different to the way of a human nose, right? So have a look at that, the, the, the slits, on the side of the nose, right? These are all things that are never really understood until going through this chapter. Why is a dog's nose so sensitive, right? So essentially we can ask the question, how does it work? It's important to understand how this system works because remember, the investigators employ both cadaver and scent dogs and they went to work on the property and around the property. And as I said to you guys last week, the important thing about these uh, beautiful creatures is that they go and do the job without any form of bias, right? They don't lie, right, Jack61? Right, guys, they don't lie. And also, they don't hate Stephen Avery. And that's very important. So the question is, how do these actually noses of the canines work? Jack61, can we have the next slide, please? Now, the anatomy of the dog, the nasal passages and everything like that is very, very different to a human being. So if we start with the actual nostril of the dog, you can see that it has slits on the side. So the amazing thing is, when a dog inhales air through its front nostrils, right, you can see it through the green arrows, it exhales air through the side slits, right? And it does it at the same time. I never even knew this. The important thing is this, when it takes a whiff of air, it doesn't dilute the air that it sniffs in. So guys on the panel, did you know that? Did you know that in chat as well? Who knew that? Anyone on the panel? Who who did nope. that? Susan? I did not know that, Doc. Who, who did had, not know that? I had no idea. Not a clue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Alice? I've got, a, I've got a bloody husky and I didn't even know oh, that. Hey. I've so my life and I didn't even know that. <laughs> yep, yep. What about you? I don't recall. No, I didn't either. No. Yep. So essentially, the good thing is, when it takes a whiff of air, it doesn't dilute the air. 
So it gets the full concentration of the molecules that it's picking up, right? But if you look at the olfactory epithelium, this is where all the magic happens, right? So basically, the olfactory epithelium is where all the sensory receptors are. And in a human being, in, in us, the surface area of the olfactory epithelium is only one inch square. You compare that to a dog. Its olfactory epithelium is 30 square inches. It's massive, right? But here's the trick in a human being. And I remember Jack61 asked this question last week. In a human being, we have around about 16 million uh, sensory receptors, about 6 million. Canines in general have over 250 million receptors, right? That's a 41 fold higher amount of receptors. Jack holy, 61. Holy shit. Are you kidding me? That's crazy. No. That is crazy. So if you look at that cross section that Jack 61 has got up, you can see that it's very convoluted, which meant which means that the surface area is massive, right? And just to give you an example, if you look at our intestines, our intestines have got what's known as villi, little projections, very much like you see here in this dog. If you take a human intestine and actually spread it out, it's got the surface area of a tennis court. That's how big the surface area is, right? It's massive. Well, a dog has got a huge surface area in its olfactory epithelium, right? And then the final point is this that the olfactory bulb, which is connected at the base of the brain, is three times larger in a dog than in a human being. And I think um, uh, the comment was made last week that a dog sense of smell is like a supercomputer. So guys, you can see that you cannot compete with a dog. Their sense of smell is phenomenal. And that's why you have cadaver dogs, scent dogs and these scent dogs they are trained to pick up different scents right live scents from a human being uh, they also used to pick up drugs explosives and believe it or not guys there are dogs now that are trained to detect certain cancers human cancers and that's unbelievable because i never realized that but the human body produces certain metabolites when an individual has cancer that a dog can smell and that's truly remarkable so guys you can now see you can now see the power of these canines right and um, the investigators brought in the canines both cadaver and scent dogs and i'm telling you now they now i bet you they now regret doing so because these dogs, without fear or favor, have exposed the shenanigans that took place, right? And after you see these podcast series or podcasts, you too will agree that the state's case against Stephen and Brendan is pure garbage. If the dogs could talk, if these canines could talk, both Stephen and Brendan would be free today. I am that passionate and serious about it. And I, I've i learned a lot and I've still got a lot to learn about these dogs. So uh, guys on the panel and in chat, was that discussion helpful? Did you understand? Yes or no? Alice, was that helpful? Yes, yes, Doc. I mean, as I say, I've had dogs all my life, uh, German Shepherds and now a Husky. And I didn't know that about their nose. Uh, I mean, I knew that they had a high sense of smell, a lot more than us. But other Girl. than that, I mean, that was about it. So, yeah, I mean, this doing this explains a lot um, for us laymans, you know. And it also makes me wonder about 
the way the dogs reacted on the salvage yard as well. Yes, yes. You know. Or that's a didn't good, react good. on the salvage yard. That, that's 100% <laughs> yeah. correct. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And it also helps me understand as well, when it comes to Luke's case, is yeah. how Mia reacted when Luke put her in working mode and yeah. she reacted to the wall, you know, but yet the man who went through the same wooded area with eight spaniels who are working dogs didn't smell nothing at the time yeah. that it was supposed to happen. You know, Correct. so you can see how the humans can alter the scent tracking and things like that. Right. You know, Correct. it's not the dogs that are in error, it's the humans no. That are reporting what the dogs do. Correct, correct, awesome. Thank you so much, Alice. What about you, Susan? Did you really um, was this helpful or not? The discussion about it, the dogs. It, it was helpful, Doc. And yeah, I, I've always known that dogs' noses are very sensitive. But um, yeah, that was that was very interesting. And I, you know, with that kind of sensitivity, I really think if Teresa's bones were in that fire pit. Day oh, yeah. one, on the fifth, yeah. you know, the dogs yeah. would have been straining to get over there. Correct. Correct. And and you'll see, you, you don't worry, we got all the testimonies that will <laughs> blow your mind. Thank you so much, Susan. What uh, about you? I don't you recall. Bet. Thank you. What about you? I don't recall. Helpful? Was that helpful? Uh, same as Alice and Susan. I, you know, I always knew dogs smelled, had a strong sense of smell, but... Didn't realize how strong and why it was so strong. So Great. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adorical. What about you, Jack61? Did oh, you learn a few things about the dog? <laughs> Absolutely. And I have to agree with Susan, uh, especially the cadaver dog. If those bones would have been in, in that pit on the fifth, yep. they would have walked. They would have, I mean, I think they would have strained to get there. And I'm also the question. garage. They would have been crazy yeah. about the garage. That too. Yes. Yeah. Correct, correct. Uh, thank you, Jack61. What about you, Jess Rhonda? Was that helpful about the dogs? Very helpful, very interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now, guys, we, we can now start the podcast proper. So, guys, you know about these dogs, right? They're super, super sensitive. One is a cadaver dog. A group of dogs were cadaver dogs. They detect human decomposition. The other dog is a bloodhound. The other type of dog is a bloodhound. It is centered and is specific for Teresa Horbach. So, Jack61, if we can have the next slide, please. All right, we'll just wait for that to come up. So, um, having read parts of um, John Farrakh's chapter, um, I became super interested to see uh, how much was actually discussed about the dogs uh, in the trial testimonies? And I was actually very, very shocked. Um, so here we meet the uh, devil with blue eyes here. Uh, this is Special Investigator Tom Fassbender, right? Uh, and he was part of the investigative team. He was one of the co-lead investigators with Mark Wiegert. And both Tom Fassbender and Mark Wiegert, of course, question Brendan Dassey and got a coerced confession from him but the question we're asking here today uh, this this is very very interesting and that is what did um, Tom Fassbender know about the dogs on the Avery salvage yard when you consider that he was the co-lead investigator so technically speaking he should have known a lot about the canines and what was found by them and he was actually questioned, uh, Tom Fassbender was questioned by Buting in Stephen Avery's pre-trial. And I'll tell you what, I am I really agree with uh, Crockett Thompson. Uh, Buting was brilliant in Stephen Avery's pre-trial. Right, Jack61? Right, guys? He was extremely aggressive and he asked a lot of very important he questions. He did. Jack he did. Oh. Yeah, he did. I have to agree. Yeah. And I was absolutely shell shocked because I went back and I read the the trial test the pre-trial testimonies, and Buting was not mucking around. 
He was very, very pointed and very, very aggressive in his questioning. And I'm going to show to you of absolute proof of tunnel vision and investigator bias. Um, I remember um, how many times have, have the foul play team gone through this? Uh, just Rhonda, do you have a comment? Um, I just I have a um, comment from the chat by from Mark Kaz. Yeah. He says, not sure if this is true, Dr. Silkman panel, but I heard on a program called QI in the UK that the blowflies are the only creatures that can detect a dead body quicker than a cadaver dog. Sounds logical I, to me, but yes, because because um, what happens is when investigators look at um, a crime scene, they look for the presence of maggots, the maggots, right? Because the the blowfly obviously must have a very very incredible sense of smell uh, to detect the biochemicals of death and decay because what they tend to do is to lay their larvae uh, in rotten meat, right? So that's a, thank you so much. That's a very interesting point because remember, if you remember the analysis that was done on the yonder burn barrels, they did mention uh, maggots, larvae uh, present. Uh, and I remember um, the uh, Eisenberg talking about the maggots but only very, very briefly. But that's a very, very important point. Um, Alice, did you have a comment? No, Doc, Rhonda bet you to it. It was just what was Mark was going to say, but oh, yeah. Rhonda bet you to it. Fantastic. Thank you. And so, guys, I'm going to absolutely show you that there was tunnel vision straight from the get-go uh, and investigative bias. Um, in the uh, trial transcripts, and Jack61 will back me up, um, remember Buting and Strang kept on telling uh, the investigators, well, did you look at anybody else? Yeah, of course we did. You know, we looked at other potential suspects. I call bullshit to that, and you'll see the reason why. So now let's have a look at Tom Fassbender. This is in the pre-trial. Jack61, can we have a look at the first slide, please? Um, now, I need a couple of readers. Um, uh, Susan, would you like to read uh, Buting's part, uh, which is the questions? And you just Ron can, yeah, and just Rhonda, can you read the answers, which are in yellow? Can you see the slide? Yep, yeah, I sure can. All right, let's go. So this is Buting questioning Tom Fassbender in the pre-trial. Susan. Well, by Saturday, November 5th, you had cadaver dogs on that property, didn't you? Yes. You were searching not only for Teresa alive, you were also contemplating the possibility she was not alive, right? Correct. So your investigation in part was a potential homicide investigation even then, was it not? Yes. Did you ever take any of those cadaver dogs into Mr. Avery's trailer? Yes. And did the dog alert on any part of his trailer? He did not, did he? Now, no, note, note, note what Buting said. He did not, did he? Right, and we know yeah. that Brutus, this is very interesting, guys. We know that Brutus was brought in at 5 35 p.m on november the 5th and did you notice what buting said he said he did not did he which meant that he is reliant on whose report guys whose report is he reliant on the dog handler yeah 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 but remember what deedring said in his report oh he didn't, yeah. Deedring said, he, he didn't hear a little alert said, yep he did not hear any alert. So Deedring is a senior investigator, right? So Buting definitely would have seen that report. And Tom Fassbender was reliant on that report. So isn't that interesting? So can we have a look at the uh, next page, please, Jack61? So 
So um, <laughs> look what look what uh, Tom Fassbender says responds. Just one. Are you ready? Uh, yes, I'm ready. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, don't I don't worry. believe so. Uh, and you said the dogs were kind of all over the property, right? Yes. This was Saturday, November 5th. I was aware because I was with one dog where we went and I know that there was some other dogs that swept through the buildings and I believe they were then utilized to sweep through the salvage yard. Okay. And because you were a co-leader, you would be told if there were any areas where these dogs were alerted. Myself or investigator, investigator Liger. Okay. And the whole purpose of these dogs is that they are trained to be able to, I don't know whether it's scent or whatever training it is, but it can assist in locating blood as, as well as deceased bodies. The theory, yeah, the theory is human blood or cadavers. And I think you used the dogs only that one day, Saturday? No. You use them throughout the... Now, before we continue, do you notice what Tom Fassbender says? He says, the theory, yeah, mm -hmm. the theory is human blood or cadavers. Guys, what yeah. does that immediately tell you about Tom Fassbender and what he thinks about the dogs? <laughs> what about he it, guys? Leave him. Yeah, he's yeah, dismissing he, yeah. them. Yep. He's, he's trying to deflect. Yes, yeah, guys, you got it. You got, and I never even knew this. I'd forgotten about it. You could tell the way he showed complete disrespect in what the dogs were finding because he said the theory, yeah, the theory is, uh, Mr. Fassbender, it's not a theory. These dogs that you brought in are highly, highly trained. So he's basically trying to deflect and trivialize what the dogs found on the salvage yard and more importantly around the salvage yard would you agree guys yeah yep. absolutely yeah yep. unbelievable and if you notice tom fassbender said he didn't believe that there was a hit inside stephen avery's trailer so he was looking at a uh, deedring's report he obviously never went through Julie Kramer's report about there being a positive dog hit, right? So they're working under false pretenses here, guys. Uh, just run that. Oh, nothing. I just was, okay. I just didn't know if I was that reading was, or not. That was, was that on Stephen's blood in the bathroom? Correct. 100% oh, yeah. yeah. correct. Yeah, correct. He, uh -huh. he, so, he, he didn't pay attention to the fact that Remaker and, and Link and Coburn ran back in there later on to get the, but at the laundry bathroom area. That's correct. And don't worry, I'll re we'll reveal all the shenanigans. So Tom Fassbender is under the impression that there was no hit inside Stephen Avery's trailer, which we know is complete garbage. All right, can we have the next page, Jack61? Um, uh, they were brought back on other occasions, along with the bloodhound. And isn't it true that none of those dogs ever alerted on a burn pit behind Mr. Avery's detached garage? Are you are you kidding me? Relevance. Yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, Objection. Relevance. And look, you said it, Jack sixty one. I Arsenal saw that. Tom Allen. Yep. He, so he, guys, he knows how he knows how damn relevant it is. Yeah. Correct. Now, guys in chat, you've got to be shocked. Guys on the panel, you've got to be shocked. Here is a really pertinent question, right? He asked. He asked Fassbender. Well, did any of the dogs actually hit uh, on the burn pit? Right? Did they actually hit on the burn pit? And Fallon blocks the answer by saying objection relevance holy shit guys That's you've insane. got you've got cadaver dogs 
You've got scent dogs that you brought in yourself, that you called in to search the property. Buting asked one of the best questions ever, and Fallon goes, objection, relevance. <laughs> relevance. <laughs> there is nothing more relevant than that question. A hundred percent. And remember, guys, this is November the 5th. This is very early on in the investigation, right? And it goes to show how Kratz knew this. And he had to blame another dog, which was Stephen Avery's own dog, Bear, for their mm -hmm. sheer incompetence, right? Because he knew that if he could, if Beauty can keep on asking these questions, the deal would have been out, right? The, the fix would have been in, right? So, guys, can you see? Would you agree on the panel? Was that a highly relevant question or not? I don't recall. It was. That's why I was I was going to ask what happened after that. Did he have to explain oh, why it wasn't worry. relevant? Or <laughs> yeah, the the judge. That I, I cut it out. There was a, a lot of a toing and froing between Fallon, the judge, and Buting, and all that rubbish. But don't worry, Buting. Susan, uh, sorry, Jack sixty one. It's completely irrelevant, and and they damn well knew it. And I had completely forgot all about all this. Oh my uh, god! Well, well, that that's why when I when I deep dived into the documents, I, I smashed another iPad. So guys, this woman, Teresa Hobak, lost her life in a most brutal way. You as an investigator, you bring in the dogs and the dogs do certain things. They either hit or they don't. And Buting asked the lead, co-lead investigator, well, did the dogs hit on the burn pit? Yes or no? And Fallon blocked it and he said, relevance. <laughs> I really hope you're going to show us how, how the judge ruled on that objection. <laughs> oh, well, Otherwise, well, I'm going to have to do some reading. <laughs> well, well, have a look at the next page. Butin gets the last laugh. Well, so, I, mean, I, I mean, that's just ridiculous, Doc. Yeah, I mean, is. I'm trying to say that Teresa was burned in that burn right. pit, dismembered and thrown in it, according to Brendan's false confession. You know, he's seen a foot, uh, well, he's seen toes, and which was attached to a foot and leg that was fed to him by um, a spender and Liger, you know. So for Fallon to come in and say, objection, right. relevance, you right. know, right. well, you said that she was Fucking I'm not burnt, but of course it's relevant. Correct. Ow. And not only not only that, remember guys, Brutus is a cadaver dog and Brutus is trained to smell human decomposition. Uh guys, would you agree that body into skeletal fragments, some of which contain muscle tissue, is a surefire hit on a cadaver dog? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Br Br Brutus little. would have smelt it from his car, from the car that he was in, right? Brutus would have never left the area, right? Because there's your high highest concentration of a human being being reduced to ash in that burn pit, and furthermore, right? Potentially, a scent dog would have hit there as well, because Teresa's scent potentially could have been around that burn pit as well, right? So the mere fact of that um, a Fallon blocked it and said re objection relevance goes to show how ridiculous this entire trial was. But Butin got the last laugh. Uh, ladies, are you ready to continue reading? You bet. Let me ask it this way. When the dogs would alert on something, that would cause you to devote some resources. You are weigered to devote some police resources to then start searching, right? Certainly. And that would potentially include evidence collection officers if upon search, they found something that looked like it was of evidentiary value, right? Yes. 
And you talked about, for instance, a suspected clandestine grave site, right? Yes. Uh, the dogs <laughs> alerted on that? Yes. And you took a team over and you spent some time working on that? Yes. And it ended up being, in fact, you were very seriously right. thinking that this was a, a potentially a new grave site and that Teresa's body might even be in there, right? Yes. So you pulled a bunch of people over there to go look at it. To deal with it, yes. Okay. Absolutely. And then it ultimately determined, uh, was determined to be nothing of value, correct? Correct. So tell me, during that week, did you have to take your resources, your evidence collection team, to the burn pit behind Mr. Avery's garage before November 8th, on the 5th, the 6th, or the 7th, did you have to take an evidence collection team to the burn pit behind Mr. Avery's garage because a dog had alerted? No. Oh, uh-huh. Very interesting. <laughs> Look at that. Look at oh, that. Oh, my you have God. To be Beauty overcame uh, Fallon's objection by asking a series of questions beforehand to say, okay, so remember, remember Jack 61, uh, Fassbender's complaint was that they were overstretched, right, guys? They were right. overstretched in resources. There were hundreds of officers, but they were overstretched. So notice what Beauty did. Beauty said, oh, so you allegedly found the clandestine burial site at Kasra. He didn't say Kasra, but we know where he's talking about. And uh, Fassbender goes, yeah. And you had to bring all the resources there, right? Yeah. But it turned out to be nothing. Yeah. So did you have to bring all these resources to Stephen Avery's burn pit? And he goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> Which proved the point that none of the cadaver dogs or scent dogs hit on the burn pit. That's right. <laughs> Nothing. Isn't that brilliant, guys? It, it is. And Fastman yeah. lied. I fully believe he's lying. He knows that they found bones there. Yeah. He knows it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I'll tell you right now, guys, Fastbender knew that they found the clandestine burial site before the dogs did. So Fassbender is in actual fact lying. He didn't have to put extra resources there because the resources were already there before the dogs found or hit on the clandestine burial site. So he's lying, Jack 61. That's, that's exactly right. Right? And you'll see, you'll see the shenanigans come undone because he's in actual fact lying, right? They found the clandestine burial site very early on in the morning. And there was a lot of resources there before the dogs got there. The dogs came later. So it's rather amazing that Fassbender's got no idea what actually took place. Yeah. Right, guys, do we have any uh, any other questions? Uh, Rhonda? Um. No, I don't see any. I see some comments in the chat, but I don't see necessarily questions. Yeah. So um, you can tell, you can tell, and I agree with Crockett Thompson. Buting was on fire, right? He he was asking really tough, pointing questions to get the truth out, what actually took place. And Fassbender couldn't tell him the truth. Uh, Susan, do you have a comment? Well, they didn't actually allow the dogs into the uh clandestine burial site right uh, yeah yes and no yes and no and you'll see what they did it's truly shocking what they did all right so jack 61 can we have a look at the next question please now uh the next um um page now remember what i said to you about tunnel vision and investigator bias have a read of this this is going to shock you 
because this is a golden nugget, right? Um, Jack 61, are you able to read the answer? And Susan, would you like to read the question? Sure. So this is, this is Buting questioning Fassbender, right? Okay. So Jack 61. All right, line nine. Stephen Nairi's initial statement to, I believe, investigator or Sergeant Coburn was that he never left his trailer and that Teresa Halbach never came to the trailer. He never spoke with Teresa Halbach. Ultimately, we received information that Teresa Halbach was seen walking up to his trailer. We received information later, obviously, that he did talk to her. So... You are saying in his initial story, he said he never talked to her? His initial statement to Sergeant Colburn was that he never spoke with Teresa Halbach. He never left the trailer. He washed her out of the window of the trailer. Well, that's not true anyway. That is such a lie. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Okay, and some subsequent information was that, I'm sorry, you said someone saw her? Walking up. Subsequent interviews indicated that she was seen walking from her vehicle up to the trailer. And then that individual lost sight of her. And then he went and went outside. She was gone. And the vehicle was still there. Who was this? Well, Bobby Dassey. Okay. And Bobby Dassey at one point was a possible suspect too, wasn't he? Objection. Relevance. Sustained. Oh, my go. God. There you go. So, guys, uh, put it in your head. Stephen Avery was a suspect uh, the moment Colburn spoke to him because they were obviously speaking to family members and they had discovered that Bobby Dassey also saw Teresa Horbach that day, Right. And he's the one that said, oh, yeah, yeah, I saw her walking up towards the trailer, Stephen Avery's trailer, when I got out to go into my car to go hunting. I didn't see her anymore, uh, but I saw her car. So right then and there, Stephen Avery became suspect number one so early on in the investigation. And this is scary because... This is all came about by a conversation between Colburn and Stephen Avery. Now, guys, would you agree that Stephen Avery is not a Rhodes Scholar? He's not an academic. Would you guys <laughs> agree with that? <laughs> yeah. No. No. Yeah. And when he... Sorry, Alice. Uh, no, no, Doc. Uh, uh, just a couple of things uh, from chat. Anthony Hill says... Uh, Faxbender had knowledge of Bobby's computer searches and he took no action. So that is a crime in itself. Oh, uh, yes. And in actual fact, yeah. in the pre-trial, uh, right at the beginning, they asked Tom Fassbender what his specialities were. And it was on internet crimes involving child pornography. Yeah. So they, yeah. therefore, Tom Fassbender had the appropriate training to understand that what was what was on the Desi computer uh, was potentially uh, very uh, an offence, possibly even a jailable offence, and nothing took place, right? Yeah. So getting back to Stephen Avery, when Stephen Avery said I didn't talk to her, he meant that he never had a big uh, chin wag and spent five or ten minutes. Yeah. He never had a conversation. Stephen yeah. Avery always said it was just hi and bye. Colburn, who's not a Rhodes Scholar himself, took it as, oh, Stephen must be hiding something because he said he never talked to her. That clearly can't be the case. So between the conversation of Colburn, Stephen Avery, and then talking to Bobby Dassey, these investigators already worked out that Stephen was being deceptive and that Stephen Avery was suspect number one, right? Yep. Number one, so That's early testing. on in the investigation. So, guys, you can see there was no funnel vision 
This proved that there was tunnel vision, all because of Colburn talking to Stephen. I think it was November the 3rd, guys, because Colburn went there, remember, to yeah. talk to yeah. Chuck. Yeah. And he encountered Stephen and his mum, Dolores. Yeah. And because yeah. of that conversation, they repeated it in court. Remember in that Stephen Avery's trial, he never talked to her. He never, remember Ken Kratz, so surprised. So Tom Fassbender just admitted Stephen Avery was suspect number one, right? Yeah. And now, guys, you can see the terrible position that uh, Bobby Dassey was in. They cornered him. And did you notice the question that uh, Buting asked? Oh, Bobby Dassey at one point was a possible suspect too, wasn't he? Fallon, objection, relevance. Oh, he didn't want yeah. that on the table at all. He didn't want no. the uh, jury uh, in any, well, this is pretrial, but he certainly it's didn't want pre-trial. Willis. Yeah, he didn't want Willis looking at that either. No. Yeah. Mark, Mark has in chat says, hi, panel in chat. Can we not refer Judge Willis as Judge? Can we refer him as Fudge Willis as he fudged the case in favour of the prosecution as best he could? <laughs> correct. 100% correct. Uh, I could probably go one better than that. And if I remember, Mark, when we're talking about Willis, I will call him fucked up Willis. How's that? Uh, is that all right for you? Um, instead of Judge Willis, we'll just call him fucked up Willis. <laughs> correct, correct. So it's rather remarkable, guys, that by going to the pre-trial, I had forgotten a lot of the pre-trial. We got an understanding of what Fassbender knew about the canines, and that was fuck all. He knew very little about what the canines were doing, and that was pretty obvious. And we also knew this is a golden nugget. Stephen Avery was in the firing line as early as November the 3rd, right? Now, imagine yeah. if Stephen had his attorney with him and Stephen said to um, to Colburn, get off my property. This is private property and never said a word, which goes to show Stephen was his own worst enemy. Guys, would you agree? He oh, was yeah. his own worst enemy. Yeah, right by talking, he tried to be open, honest. Uh, come into my trailer, check it all out, and look what look what well, look what happened to him. Colburn right. noted, uh, he must be showing deception. Yep. Jack sixty one. Yep, that's exactly right. He was his own worst enemy. His own worst enemy, guys, which is so so sad. All right, so can we have a look at the next slide, please? And to me, when I saw this. I was completely and utterly shocked, and I would love to get some feedback from Barb, um, what she honestly felt about this, because this photograph showed Tom Fassbender and Bobby Dassey uh, having a bit of a chit-chat outside the, the, the courtroom. And I'm thinking to myself, this cannot be good, right? This cannot be good. And my understanding was that uh, Bobby Dassey was actually told off uh, for wearing that top. I uh, can't confirm it. I read it somewhere because he was mimicking Stephen Avery in his uh, prison garb, right? The Monopoly man suit, right? He, yeah, look at the top that he was wearing. He was told to change his clothing um, because it, it, it uh, was mimicking what Stephen was wearing. Uh, Susan, do you have a comment? I don't, Doc. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, to me, looking at that picture, you know, when you consider that his own brother, his own brother was arrested and Stephen Avery was arrested, it's hard to believe Bobby Dassey having a, a big discussion with Tom Fassbender. All right. That there's something wrong with that image. I don't know what people in chat think, but um, that's a rather bizarre image. All right, guys. So can we have the next slide, please, at Jack61? It gets better. It really gets better. So another very important person who should have not been there was Detective Dave Remica. Now, Remica is like Colburn and Link. They're absolutely everywhere, everywhere. 
and they shouldn't have been on that property. So I wanted to find out what did Dave Remiker know about the canines? Right, guys? Isn't that fair enough? What did what did the Detective Dave Remiker know about the canines that were on the Avery Salvage Yard, right? And again, he was questioned by Butine at Stephen Avery's pre-trial. Now, here's the question. Did Remaker actually perjure himself on the stand? And did he actually have an ulterior motive? And the answer is, you betcha. So let's have a look at the next slide. So this is the uh, pre-trial testimony. Um, Susan, would you like to read the part of Butink? You bet. And I I don't recall. Would you like to read the part of Remica that's in pink? Okay. Beautiful. So this is Detective Dave Remica. Let's go, guys. All right. All right. And now you you went back, I assume, had some other duties elsewhere on the property after that, but then you returned to the trailer, that is Stephen Avery's trailer, at 5.35 p.m. with the dog handler. Do you recall that? No. Do you even remember going in the trailer, in Stephen Avery's trailer, at any point with the dog handler? I did not. Let's see. I'm going to show you an excerpt from the Calumet County Sheriff's Department report, page 89 at the top. Ask you to review that last three paragraphs. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I've had discussions about the that entry. About that what? About the entry on the report that makes reference to myself going into the residence with the dog handler. And does that refresh your recollection on this? No, that wasn't me. So you are saying that this report is an error? It is not my report. My report indicates the times that I was in the residence for some. Now reason. remember, oh, Rem sorry. Remica has so sorry guys. Remica has just denied being in the uh, Stephen Avery's trailer with the dog. <laughs> He's denied yeah. it. Okay. For some reason, my name was listed as an individual going in on that occasion but that's not the case. Okay. So you at no point entered with a cadaver dog to look around the apartment? Must have been somebody else that he documented. That wasn't me. Were you aware that that was done? I don't believe so. Okay. All right. Uh, in any event, you did go back in the trailer that is Mr. Stephen Avery's trailer, again, on November 5th, correct? Yes. And I'm talking about after the search warrant was obtained. Correct. And it was approximately 7.30, I believe? Correct, yes. And so we have these times for the record. If I told you that you entered the Avery trailer, Stephen Avery trailer, at 7.30 p.m. and exited at 10.05 p.m. Would that fit with your recollection? That sounds right. All right. Now, you watch me take Remica apart, and this is very important. And it, it finally dawned to me what he did, right? And the reason why he did it, okay? It makes perfect sense. So if we have a look at the next page. So Remica denied being inside Stephen Avery's trailer with Brutus, the dog handler. Now, if we have a look at this report, this is written by John Deedering. He's a seasoned investigator. There's no question about that. Um, he's been around the trap. He understands. He carries a notebook. He writes down everything as he observes it. And quite clearly in this report, this is the one that Buting had. This is Queso, page 89. Deedring mentions uh, Remica twice. And he, and he, and I quote, and I quote, at 
1735, which is 535. Detective Remaka, Julie Kramer, Brutus, and I, which meant that Deedring went in as well. And Deedring knows who Remaka is. Okay? He knows who Remaka is. Remaka is very distinctive looking. You can't make a mistake. And I did enter the Stephen Avery residence. We did exit the residence at uh, 1740. They were in there for five minutes with a cadaver dog. Five minutes with a cadaver dog. Stephen Avery's trailer is small. It's worked out to be around about 700 square feet, I think, or square meters. It was very, very small. I personally did not observe any alerts from the canine, right? So D-Drink obviously must have lost his sense of hearing because uh, we know from Julie Kramer's report, right, Susan, that the yeah. dog gave a bark, an alert inside the laundry area uh, and bathroom area, which is very close to Stephen Avery's bedroom, master bedroom. And guys, did Brutus give a hit inside the master bedroom? No, no, he did not. No, no, Brutus did not. Brutus did not give a hit inside the master bedroom. The master bedroom is where all the terrible, terrible things allegedly that occurred to Teresa Horbach. No hit. This is a cadaver dog that detects human decomposition, the smell of death. Nothing. But, but, but the but, dog. Sorry, Jack 61. I'm sorry, dog. That dog would have went nuts in there if all that shit happened. Sorry, it would have. The dog would not have left. The dog would not have if left. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Doc, isn't it true that even if some of her skin, dry skin cells were in there, that dog can pick that up? Correct, because the skin will start to decompose and break down. Okay, Skin is organic material. It's made up of cells. And when they're exposed to the air, when they're not attached to the body, they're going to start breaking down, right? So remember, these cadaver dogs are so good, they can smell a human body inside a body of water in a lake because the human body produces gases that go to the surface and they can smell it. If Teresa Horbach was inside Stephen Avery's trailer, the dog would have gone bananas, right? Because there would have been signs of blood, skin, tissue, hair, you name it, all over the place. There's no way that Stephen Avery could hide that, right? But you and have they, to remember that he scoured that trailer. Uh, even if he scoured the trailer, <laughs> some of the material, some of the material will get into the carpet, right? And remember what yeah. I said in my presentation, MVAC it. But these guys MVAC did one step better. They cut the carpet and turned it around, and they found no sign of blood. Right? <laughs> they found no That's evidence a, of blood. Took right? the paneling but, off the wall. Yep. Yes, the bedding. You know, but here's an important point. Deedring writes Remica's name twice. Remica denied it, and now I know why. Deedring became deaf, selectively deaf, and said, "I didn't hear a dog bark." And now I know why <laughs> they were both helping each other, right? So Jack 61, this is an important point. D-Drink, when they put up the login sheet, because I went to the login sheet, I deep dived into this. I'm there, okay, because we know that Remica was there earlier during the day because he went up to the RAV4, right, Jack 61? Went yep. up to the RAV4, yep. read the VIN number. So D-Drink was called out very early on. Then the detective said, Jeepers, we better do a sign-in sheet. I think the sign-in sheet was later on that day. Well, Remica signs in at 15.26, 3.26 p.m. on the sheet. Notice that's before uh. he enters into the trailer. So he's there. He's already there. He's on the property. And he signs out. Look at the time he signed out at 10.41 p.m. that night. So he was there for the majority of the day. Susan. Yeah. 
Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I was looking at yep. it wrong. Never mind. Okay. Yep. So if you look at the login sheet, he was there. Remica was there. Jack 61. Yeah. I, I know that Susan was uh, probably thinking about that video that Yoros made and where he was really making fun of Fastbender. Scoured that trailer. Scoured. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. You ready for the next slide? You ready for the next slide, Doc? Yes, yes, yes. But this goes to show the bullshit of Dave Remaker. I caught him out, and I've worked out what he did. Um, now, who would like to read this one out? Who would like to do it? I can Susan, read it. Uh, yes. uh, Susan, sixty one. Well, yeah. Susan, Susan can read it. It don't matter. Go for it, who Dad. Would like to do it? Okay. All right. This. Okay. So this. So this guys, pay attention. I, I checked in Queso, and this blew my mind. Now notice this is November the fifth, and this was written by Gary Steyer, right? So the title. I'll just read the title. It says search warrant execution of Stephen Avery's residence and the address, and it's November the fifth. Jack 61, are you ready to read? And I'm guys, ready. pay close attention who is there and what they do. All right. On Saturday, 11.505 at 3.48 p.m., Investigator Gary Steer of Calumet County Sheriff's Department, along with Detective Dave Remaker of the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, did conduct initial entry into the residence of 12 932 Avery Road, Residence of Stephen A. Avery. Detective Remaker did open the storm door to the residence, whereupon Steer did observe a red blood like substance located. Red blood like substance. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I remember this right here. Red blood like substance uh, located on the edge of the storm door by the door handle. Detective Remaker did find the door locked. Investigator Steer and Detective Remaker walked around the trailer in a counterclockwise direction looking for a door or window that was unlocked. Investigators returned to the front door where Detective Remaker knocked on the door announcing, quote, Sheriff's Department search warrant, end quote. Investigators waited approximately 15 seconds. Detective Remaker made forced entry by kicking the door three times. On the third kick, the door opened, and Detective Remaker and Investigator Steer entered the residence. Upon entering the residence, Investigator Steer announced, quote, police search warrant, end quote. After a search for Teresa Halbach in the residence, investigators left the residence at approximately 3.58 p.m. Investigator Steer, along with Detective Remaker, did enter a locked, detached garage located on the property at 1299-32 Avery Road at 4.03 p.m. Investigator Steer checked the door to the detached garage and found it to be locked. Investigator Steer then forced open the door with his shoulder. Investigator Steer struck the door once. The door opened, and investigators then entered the garage. After checking the interior for Teresa Halbach and not finding Teresa, investigators did exit the garage at 4.06 p.m. Deputy Schultz and Deputy Matuzik of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department remain on scene outside the residence. Ho, ho, ho. All right. What? Now, check this out. Check this out. I reckon I've worked it out. So, uh, Investigator Steyer and Dave Remaker obtained a search warrant, right? Uh, they went up to the judge, got a search warrant to go inside Stephen Avery's property and his garage. So notice when they walked in, prior to walking in, they detected a red blood-like substance. I read Dave Remaker's report, MTSO report. He saw it too. So think about it, guys. They were on the Avery salvage yard. Dave Remaker already knew that Teresa Horbach's vehicle was present on the Avery salvage yard. He got a search warrant. He entered into Stephen Avery's trailer at 3.48 p.m. 
and in that property they had observed blood or red um dried uh, red blood like substance right so they're putting two and two together teresa's missing they found her rav4 they go to stephen avery's trailer and they detect this uh, red blood like substance their minds as investigators are already ticking over guys would you agree yes or no absolutely right so even guys in chat, would you agree? You go up to Stephen Avery's trailer, you see blood, you're going, uh-oh, something's happened here. It's right there at the front door. Right. Is that, yep. Is that fair enough? Fair right enough. at the front door. That's right. right? Yep. Yep. And the important thing is this. Dave Remicker has got a search warrant, and this is what happens next. After he went inside Stephen Avery's trailer, observed the blood, when in the garage, they checked the garage on November the 5th and Stephen Avery's trailer, they found no evidence of Teresa Hallbach, but they detected blood. Now, look what happens next. At 5.35 p.m., he enters in with Brutus, who's a cadaver dog. Now, if you've entered into the trailer at 3.48 p.m. and you notice blood, wouldn't you want to go in again with a cadaver dog who detects blood? Yes or no? Of course. Absolutely. Of course you do. Of course you do. So Dave Remicker goes in because he's got the search warrant. He's got the search warrant. So he's allowed to go into Stephen Avery's trailer. I don't think Brutus has got a search warrant, right? But Dave Remicker has. So he goes back in with Brutus, and Brutus does a hit. He does a hit inside the laundry. He detects blood. Dave Remicker probably saw drops of blood on the floor, right? So notice what Deidre goes. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear any barks. So hence, in his report, Fassbender goes. No, I don't think there was a hit. But Dave Remicker heard Brutus do a hit. So this is what happens next. At 7.30 p.m., guess who goes back into Stephen Avery's trailer? Guys, you want to guess? I know, I, I know who went back Remicker, in. <laughs> Coburn and Remicker, Link. Remicker, Coburn and Link. Link. The Three they Stooges. Go back in. The Three Stooges go back in. And guess where they go? They go to the bathroom area immediately because Link was assigned to go to the bathroom area. What do all three do? They start blood. collecting blood. Yep. They start yep. collecting blood. Every blood droplet they see in the residence and around the property, they start collecting. Now, guys, here's a question. Did they call the crime lab? No. No. Should have been the first. It should have been the first thing they done was inform the mobile crime. And they they were there. They were Correct. out there. Yeah. Correct. But can you see what they did? They kept. They said, "No, I didn't hear a dog. I didn't hear a dog bark." So hence, there's no need to alert the crime lab. Correct. Does anyone think uh, that they're inside and they're talking about themselves? Saying, "Hey, we need to come back in here no and get this question. blood." Right. No. Did you question. notice? Did you notice how he wrote? I didn't personally witness the dog uh, Correct. alert. Correct. He uh -huh. he he didn't say I didn't hear because I didn't witness. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. Right. So the three Stooges go back in at seven thirty, and they go through the property big time they collect all the blood samples they go in the bedroom they start collecting forensic evidence they start doing photography they're processing the trailer like a crime scene they never even tell the crime lab the crime lab comes in last after everything's already been done and look how long they were in the trailer for guys so much for a cursory look they were there from 7 30 to 10 05 p.m alice Two and a half hours. Yeah, yep. yeah, it's it's ridiculous. But in my opinion, Doc, every one of them 
Liger, Aspender, Rimmikar, the lot of them, they all lied on the stand, even though they took an oath. Um, but Docker in chat says, uh, Doc, just stepping back, cadaver dogs don't alert on skin cells, do they? Well, Isn't look, that yeah. scent dogs that alert on skin cells? Well, this is interesting. This is interesting because if it's skin cells, uh, they'll start to decay. They'll start to break down. So it's all, and in actual fact, cadaver dogs did alert on skin, which we'll talk about probably in another episode. That's going to blow your mind, right? Well, the, well so, it would have been full of skin cells, right? Stevens, Jody's. I mean, oh, correct. you would think. Correct. Oh, correct. yeah. Correct. Now, that's a good if point, the, Crocker. Yeah. So that's a good point. So it's almost like a crossover. There will be scent. But it's not the scent of a living person. It'll be the scent of death and decay. Because the skin, when you flake off your skin, the skin cells are already dead. They've keratinized. So that's they the must, keratin. They, they must train them around that because yes, you're going to find those everywhere you go. Yes, yeah. they do. They do. Okay. They do. So the, the thing is, is that on a living person, it's not considered dead. Your, your tissue is not considered dead. It's living. Otherwise, those cadaver dogs will be barking 24-7, correct? Yeah, right. They'll be picking up, they'll be picking up uh, skin cells on every human being. They don't. They pick up the scent of decomposition. Uh, if there's any presence of sloughed off skin, that's considered dead. A cadaver dog would hit on that, right? So this is interesting. So... Remica goes inside Stephen Avery's trailer first at 3.48 p.m. He checks the trailer. He noted that there was blood, right? So he re-enters in again, which he denied, at 5.35 p.m. with a cadaver dog. The cadaver dog does a hit. Remica's brain is going, oh, my God, something's happened here. He goes back in with Lincoln Colburn. And they are the crime scene detectives at 7.30 p.m., right? That's why Butting and Strang went berserk. Because what are you guys doing in there? And that's why Fassbender said we were lacking resources. Guys, I call bullshit to that because the crime lab were out there twiddling their thumbs. They never called the crime lab until way after. So can you see, guys, Lenk? Colburn uh, and Remica already thought that something happened in that trailer. Guys, correct or not? But they didn't, already they explain, didn't they explain that away, that the crime scene was doing important things and they were busy? No. no. What, what, what they forgot to tell you was that, the and, and I read Erdl's testimony, it was raining. He said we were just waiting around. And they said they said to Erdl, so you could have gone into Stephen Avery's trailer and, and did the process? And he goes, sure. But you weren't yeah. called immediately? No. <laughs> so, guys, can you see what they did to Erdl is what they did to Deborah Kakic. They kept Erdl out of the loop. Guys, would you agree? So the critical first yeah. responding team was not the crime lab. Not Earl and his colleagues, it was Lenk, Colburn, and Remica who should have never been there because of MTSO. And two of them were deposed by St in Stephen Avery's trial, right? Depositions. So, guys, can you see that the investigation had already been started? They already Dude, thought Stephen was guilty. Skewed immediately. Yeah, skewed immediately. Yeah, they were deposed. Um... Uh, two and a half, two weeks prior. I'd have to look at the date, but yeah. It was very, very similar. So notice Remica signs out or exits Stephen Avery's trailer at 10.05. They have fully processed the trailer by that time. There's three of them. It's a small trailer, right? And he signs out at 1041 which meant that there's no doubt that they were talking amongst themselves. Hey, we've collected all this blood. It's relatively fresh blood, right? On swabs and the RAV4 um, 
would have likely still been on that property because they took the RAV4 fairly late by trailer. So this is remarkable, guys. Why would Remica deny being in there? And that's because he got a leg up of the cadaver dog hitting. And that explains why they all went in. The three amigos went in at 7.30 and started processing the crime scene, the so-called crime scene. Now, let me tell you right now, I read Rebecca's report, testimony. They collected between 10 and 20 swabs. 10 and 20 swabs. How many of those swabs came back positive for Teresa Horbach? How many? <laughs> Zero. 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 But, guys, can you see that now, because they had Stephen Avery's fresh blood, potentially, that nefarious things could have been done using those swabs? What do you reckon, guys? Yes or no? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Hundred percent. But their mindset was that Teresa Horbach was in that trailer immediately. So remember what Fassbender said? Oh yeah, yeah. When when uh, Stephen spoke with uh, Colburn, it was very inconsistent. So they were already pointing a finger at Steve on November the third, guys. November the third. Uh, Susan. I'm good. Uh Okay, so guys, um, did that help? Did that explanation help you guys understand why Remica had to deny being with the cadaver dog? Because he got insider information from the cadaver dog. Absolutely. Jack Absolutely. It, yeah, correct, correct. And that will explain, because Jim, Jim Crane said it, when Fassbender rang up um uh, Cohane and said, try to put her in his trailer or garage. Guys, they've already had investigator bias tunnel vision. Though they, they knew in their mind that Stephen Avery had killed Teresa Horbach in his trailer. In his trailer. And so now they were trying to put all the forensic, you can now understand that they were trying to put all the forensic evidence against Stephen and only Stephen because the investigators had no idea about Brendan Dassey at this stage. Remarkable. All right, guys, do we have any questions? We're all good? All right. Uh, Jack61, let's have a look at the next slide. All right. So now, we'll just wait for that slide to come up. Now we're looking at the events of November the 7th, right? And this is where we left off the last slide. And this truly is remarkable. So if you have a look, this is the cul-de-sac at the end of Cuss Road. And the foul play team, we've discussed Cuss Road ad infinitum. Many, many times we've devoted a lot of time, but now we can introduce the dogs and the dogs tell a very interesting story. So you can see right at the end of Cuss Road, this is November the 7th, there's a lot of vehicles there. There's a lot of activity there. And further up from the uh, cul-de-sac, there's a little road that takes you to Josh Redont's deer camp, right? And as I said in the uh, other um, podcast, the deer camp is surrounded by a quarry, right? You can see the quarry and dense forestation, right? So that's known as a hunting lodge, right? That belongs to Josh Rodon, where his buddies or whoever can rent it out uh, to go hunt for um, wildlife like deer. So Jack61, can we have the, a look at the next slide? Now, there's no doubt that the uh, investigators went uh, to Josh Redon's deer camp uh, because they photographed it, right? They took lots of photographs of the deer camp. So we'll just wait for the uh, photo to come up. And uh, at the deer camp, we'll just wait for that picture. Yep. 
Uh, do you have the next slide, Jack 61, number 11? Beautiful. So you can see here the trailers uh, that were at the deer camp. Apparently there were three trailers. And if you have a look on the right hand side towards the middle of the picture, on the right hand side towards the middle, yeah, that's police crime scene tape, right? And the important thing to real, and we'll get to this, the important thing to realize is that there was crime scene tape all over the place, right? Or, right, right, Jack 61, there was crime scene tape all over Cuss Road. It was absolutely everywhere. Miles and of so it. If we have a, miles of it. Miles of it. So if we have a look at the next slide, Jack 61, uh, we notice a very, we'll see a very interesting trailer uh, on the... Uh, um, at the hunting lodge and it's a red trailer pay attention close attention to this particular trailer right so guys with these trailers um hunters hunters could rent them out and they go hunt deer in uh, around the area but the um the hunting lodge was a hive of activity the investigators were there the photographers were there uh, it's very, very interesting. And also the dogs were in this area as well. Okay, so this is Josh Redon's deer camp. Can we have a look at the next uh, slide at Jack 61? So this is where we pick up um, John Farrakh's book. This is um, 13. Okay. Do you have the new version of this Jack 61 or using the uh, older version? Do you have um, 13A or you've just got 13? I should have both. Uh, just a second. See if you can see if you can find the because um, I sent you um, some new slides. See if you've got 13A. I do. Yeah, I do have 13A. Beautiful. Because um, I changed all the slides. Uh, I made it slightly easier to read. Um, Susan, would you like to read a 13A, please? So now we're going back to John Farrakh's book. Monday, November 7, marked the fifth consecutive day of a constant Manitowoc County law enforcement presence around Avery's property. But not everybody who showed up at Avery Road had a stake in the outcome of making sure that Avery went down for the crime. Notably, Kalkana canine handler, Sarah Fausk, who showed up with her bloodhound, Loof. Okay. Now, Jack61, can we have a look at the next slide? That should be 13B. Beautiful. So this is, um, I actually call her Sarah Fawski. What, what do you call her, Susan? Fausk? Fa Fausk. Fausk? Yeah. Yeah. So this is Sarah Fausk uh, with her beautiful... Um, Bloodhound Loof. And um, uh, Loof was on the property uh, searching, of course. Uh, and the important thing about Loof is that Loof is a bloodhound. It is a live scent dog. Okay. That's the important thing. A Loof, she is a live scent dog. Okay. Very, very different to Brutus, who detects human decomposition. Okay, so Loof was brought out. Uh, Jack 61, can we have the next slide, please? This is 13C. All right, Sheriff Susan. Poggle, to continue sorry. Quote, Sheriff Poggle did have two pairs of shoes that belonged to Teresa Halbach. Both were bagged separately in plastic bags. I placed sterile gauze in the toes of all the shoes and removed the insole in a plastic bag with sterile gauze. The shoes were then secured in my personal vehicle." And quote. Fausk explained. When Luf began her task of sniffing for Halbach's scent, The next one, Jack 61, 14A. 14, no, it should be 14A. Do you have that one, Jack 61? 
There it is. That's it. Beautiful. It was around 1.30 p.m., 57 degrees, and there was a slight breeze, zero to five miles per hour, blowing from the northwest. Quote, unquote, find, Bausk yelled to Luf. Out near Avery's yard, Luf followed her nose over toward Barbianda's maroon van, where Teresa had snapped a few photos a week earlier. Eventually, quote, Luf went up to the south door of the trailer home, the door having a small porch entrance, and the door was white in color. Canine Luf wanted to enter the home. Canine Luf continued north along the trailer and went between some pine trees and a burning barrel. Canine Luf smelled a charred area showing some interest, then continued west. Canine Luf went west in a picked cornfield. Directly to the south was a gravel pit, and in between the two was an area of brush and trees. End quote. All right. All right. Uh, the next one, Jack 61, is 14B. So you can see what they did. Um, the investigators uh, took uh, uh, two pairs of shoes from Teresa Horbach uh, and um, Sarah Forsky, um, Forsk, uh, put in sterile gauze to basically obtain the scent of Teresa Horbach from the shoes. And what she did was very important. She took the shoes, the insoles, and locked them in her car, right? Probably put them in a sterile bag to make sure that the scent did not escape. Right, guys? She then scented Loof. Okay, so Loof now had detected the scent or has been scented for Teresa Horbach. Does everyone understand? So Loof is looking for Teresa Horbach. Guys, do you agree? Yes or no? Yes. Yep. She's not looking, Loof is not looking for anybody else. Loof has been scented with the scent of Teresa Horbach. And that's why they used a personal item belonging to Teresa Horbach. Now, no one else but Teresa Horbach would be wearing Teresa Horbach shoes. I don't think Ryan Hilligus would have been wearing them. Right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. You never know. You never know. You never know. So the um, Louf has now been scented and said, go. Uh, her dog handler said, go. So she's off her leash and said, go. Notice what Luf does immediately. Luf goes to the van. Now, guys, you've got to be impressed by this because Amazing. we know it's incredible. This is November the 7th. Teresa Horbach was there on October the 31st, right? Uh, and both Brent, uh, sorry, Bobby Dassey and Stephen Avery said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We saw it come in. Get out of the car, go to the van, and snap some pictures. This is incredible, guys. Luf detected Teresa Horbach's scent at the van, right? And that's amazing because it meant that her scent is still around the area. And that's remarkable. That's an incredible control. Jack 61. Just a minor question, and I'm not sure you've obviously done more reading than uh, probably the rest of us, but when you talk about a live scent, uh, these dogs, I guess, are trained by a certain wording or whatever when they're presented with a new scent that they're going to be tracking. Like, you know, they they get they get scented with a whatever an object like Teresa's shoes. Uh, there's got to be some commands. I'm guessing. I, I'm only because I don't know. Did you read anything about how that worked? Just briefly. I'm just curious. Uh, different different dog handlers um, have different commands. So these dogs, they won't move until the dog handler says, search, go. So in other words, the dog handler is communicating with their canine. So they, they've trained for many, many years. So the dog responds to certain commands. So Luf is trying to go searching when her dog handler says certain commands, 
right? right. So, um, so basically search, go. So the dog knows, okay, I can now start looking for this scent. And the way these dogs work is they, uh, it's not no work for them. When they go hunting for a scent, they want to give, if they find that scent, they give an alert to the, to the dog handler. Now, I've learned that certain dogs, when they find a hit, they do two things. They either bark or lie down. They lie down. They sit. Yeah. They sit still. And I've they look seen, at the I, dog handler. Yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah. Yeah, or well, they nod their head to say, "Okay, time for my reward. Time for my reward." Curiously right? enough, that's curiously, that's cur- curiously enough, about this particular moment in time, I was actually looking for something else earlier today, and I ran across a um, a call, a dispatch call, where Poggle oh. is talking. Yeah, Poggle is talking to dispatch about who's going to pick up the shoes at Teresa's house. He thought oh. he was going, and it turned out it was. I don't know if it was Tyson. I think it was Tyson that went and picked him up. Right. It was. It wasn't Poggle. Right. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Doc. Yes. Uh, I have a question on that. Just that previous slide that I read. Did it say that um, he actually alerted on the van, or he just went over there? Oh, uh, went over there. Went over there. Okay. So, so basically, the investigators said. The only information that the investigator said to Forsky was that this is where Teresa was, where she photographed. This is where her van is. That's it. That's it. So if the dog, Louf, paid no attention to the van, you would be worried, right? But the dog, Louf, went to the van, probably started to sniff around it. That's so, amazing. That's actually quite amazing. So Lou, Lou yeah, detected. because I, I would think, oh, well, it's been a week and she didn't actually even no. touch the van. I mean, you no, know, no. so it, it is it, really it'll amazing. Be gra- it'll be in the grass. It'll be in the yeah. ground. It'll be uh-huh. in the ground. So um, Crockett Thompson said, okay, what makes a percent? The thing is we um, give off odorants. Uh, there are biochemical processes that we produce when we're alive, right? These are very distinct smells. Plus we shampoo, we put on perfumes, all sorts of things make up the um, smell of an individual. And the smell of an individual is all unique, right? You, You can remember being at work when somebody walks in with certain aftershave or they've used a certain shampoo. They're very distinct smells. Remember a dog, the sense of sensitivity of their nose is phenomenal. They can pick it up, right? So even though you can't smell it, the dog can. Alice, do you have a comment? Uh, just, I mean, just on the um, the dog thing. I mean, when I take Loki out, um, and I mean, it's it's getting into the summer now, so you've got the the, the foxes running a bit, you've got deer running a bit. Um, other dog scents and everything, but when I take him out, he sniffs the air. You know, yes. it's like something catches his nose and he sniffs it, and he can sniff the air for a good few minutes or so. And I have to say to him, you know, if it's in the bloody air, it could be anywhere, you know, Correct. but he Correct. still sniffs the air as, as well as sniffing around a bit him. And when we're out on a walk, it's a lot of wooded areas and things like that that um, yes. I walk him in. So there's lots of bushes and, and things like that. And he'll just, he'll stop dead and he'll start sniffing and he'll look in a certain direction. And I can't see bugger all, you correct, know. But correct, correct. But, 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 but does your dog's nose change direction as well? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he because does. He's, your dog is finding where it's more concentrated. Yeah. So they, yeah. They, they're like an antenna. Their nose is like an antenna. Where's the smell more concentrated? Where do I need to go next? 
right? Yeah, he also so, walked backwards or forwards as well, Doc, trying to find yes. that strongest bit of the sin, you know? And it just it sometimes it maddens me because he's like constantly sniffing the air and I'm like, if it's in the bloody air it could be four miles away, you daft bugger. You know? Correct. Because we have a lot of fields with cows and sheep yes. and things like that. Yes. So we could be picking up their scent, you know, and we could be a good half an hour away from where they actually are. And he's still sniffing the air. So, I mean, the dog's nose is remarkable. But to still smell Teresa, was yeah. that five days afterwards, the 31st yeah. Yeah. to the 5th, yeah. you know? The, this is the 7th. This well, is the 7th. I mean, that's even longer, you know? So right. it is remarkable that he could even still pick up Teresa's scent yep. at that van, you know? Correct, it's, correct. But the, you have to admit, this is a perfect positive control because if Luf paid no attention to the van, then you're going, wait a minute, that can't be right. Both Bobby Dassey and Stephen Avery said, yeah, yeah, she came, got out of her, got out of her vehicle and um, photographed the van. So her yeah. scent, her scent is still there. And yeah. that's truly yeah. incredible because a dog, the power of a dog to smell is just so much more stronger than a human being. Alice. Yeah, definitely. Um, Mystic Jinx in chat. Hi, Mystic Jinx. She hey, says, Mystic. is the record of the, the shoes being picked up? Never seen one. Never seen an evidence ledger for the shoes either. The woman listed as a KPD wasn't there as an officer, but a dog handler with a different business. No record of her activities with Kakuna PD. Been trying to find out where those shoes went. Yeah, very, very interesting. Because I tell you what, if they still exist, you can now you could resent another uh, another scent dog and bring them bring the dog back out, right? Uh, it, you you wonder whether the dog can still pick up the scent of Teresa Horbach at the Avery Salvage Yard after all these years. Jack sixty one. Sorry to keep you waiting. No, no, it's okay. Um, it is interesting because they had called Great Lake Search and Rescue out. And so they yes. were on scene. She wasn't, Sarah Falsk was not part of Great Lakes. It's interesting that no. it's no. interesting that they used her in addition to having Great Lakes on scene as well. And another yes. thing I want to address, you might as well address it now because it's going to come up. And what Crockett's talking about is this contamination that's potential. Uh, I don't know if you're going to address that later or if you want to talk about it now. The contamination. Okay, okay. I'll just let you talk about okay. it. Yeah, the, the, impo the important thing is is that you mustn't create false trails for the, for the scent dogs, especially for the scent dogs. Cadaver dogs are different. Cadaver dogs, they will go and find where there is human decomposition, Right. And when they train cadaver, do uh, cadaver dogs, they go out into a field. I've seen the videos, and they, they might put a jaw, they might put some tissue, they might put some biochemical smells, which come from a, um, which mimic a dead person. They scatter them. The cadaver dog will find where they are. With a scent dog, you've got to be very, very careful, and that's why Sarah Forsky. When she used the material to scent the dog, she kept it in her car to make sure that the, that somebody wasn't walking around with Teresa Horbach's shoes. Guys, you understand that? Because wherever, if yeah. somebody was carrying her shoes or an item of clothing belonging to Teresa Horbach, potentially leaving a scent trail, and the dog would go, hey, she's there. No, she's there. So that's why you use a single item and you keep it in your vehicle so the dog is not fooled. A uh, Jack 61. Well, you know, along with that, and again, I know nothing about this this whole industry, but, you know, I would think personally that they would have used more than one. And, and, you know, use her. That's fine. I don't have a problem with using her dog, but at least use one more dog from Great Lake Search and Rescue. No, I, think, I, I, I believe there were multiple um, scent dogs. I believe there were multiple bloodhounds, and, the, and they all hit and with, with the, the, they all hit with the the same pair of shoes. Is that right? Well, the only 
I don't know. I do not know. Check 61. I think you said that there's a report that's still missing. I've only I've only seen uh, Forsky's report and Kramer's report. That's yeah. it. Yeah, I think there's one. Yeah, actually, I'm sure there's one more that we still haven't got, can't get. Yeah, and I'll tell Jinx you what's has very a good point. Sorry. Yeah, go for it, Susan. Jinx has a good point. She said she was still a, a missing person when the car was found. Why didn't they bring out scent dogs for her right away? The well, first dog, there me, was a cadaver dog, correct? Let me, let me, correct. Let me tell you, Bru and even Mr. Kratz says it in his book, and even Tom Fassbender, remember the questioning done by Tom Fassbender in the pre-trial? Because you were looking for her either alive or dead, even at that stage, and he goes, yes. And uh -huh. Ken Kratz in his book, Ken Kratz in his book said, the moment the cadaver dog hit on the RAV4, we knew it was a homicide, because uh -huh. it meant that in that RAV4, there was blood. Now, here's the, here's the kicker. Does the cadaver dog, sorry, does the cadaver dog know it was Teresa Horbach? No. That or does he know blood. that she didn't cut her finger at one point no. and bled in her car? No. I, I... no, no, she doesn't. He, the, the cadaver dog doesn't. Brutus would not. Brutus detects human decomposition. So Brutus can't say, oh, yeah, um, I detected Teresa Horbach because we know in that RAV4, there was Teresa Horbach's blood and hence DNA. There was Stephen Avery's blood and hence DNA. And Jack 61, there was A23. And we don't know who that belongs to. That was on the outside of the RAV. That's so right. the question is, what did what did Brutus detect? A23 or the blood inside the RAV or all three? You don't know. But right. as soon as the cadaver dog did the hit, they're thinking she's dead. Teresa Horbach's dead. That was their thinking because the cadaver dog detects human decomposition. So they're thinking, oh, my God, Brutus did a hit. We're likely looking for a dead body. That, that was their way of thinking. And so I don't know why they didn't call a scent dog uh, till a little bit later. But if you look on the uh, log sheets, there were dog handlers all over the place coming in and out all the time. Jack 61. Good question. Yeah, which, good yeah, question. Which, yeah, which begs the question, why didn't they open the RAV immediately? They could have pulled it into one of the Avery empty bay garages and opened it right there. That's and a massive, massive red flag right there. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Alice. Um. Audra M. Hi, Audra. Nice to see you in chat. Um, she says, why shoes? It seems odd. Yeah, but no, not really if you think about it. People are working. They wear their shoes all the time, so their Correct. feet are sweaty. It's hot. Wait. If you wear your trainers, you go to the gym, you do a run, everything like that. So that scent all gathers up, and that's that one specific scent. And you probably don't wash your shoes and things like that as often as you wash your clothes. It's a very, very high concentration of scent. And yeah, I, I, yeah. I, 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 I implore you, wear your shoes for a week, take them off and take a big whiff. It's very, yeah. very powerful. So you can imagine yeah. to a dog. To a scent dog, the scent dog would have gone bananas. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, I mean, that's the only reason why I can think of that they use the shoes, Doc, is because, oh, like I said, you know, your shoes don't get washed or anything like that right. as much as what your clothes and that do. So that would be a perfect way to get somebody's body scent, in a sense. Right. So I hope that helps you, Audra. It's the only way I can think yeah. of, of why they chose shoes in particular to give to the dog um, because you don't wash so what, them as you wash everything else. Yeah. So what, what Sarah did was she would have got sterile gauze and put it jammed it in the in the uh, the foot of the of the shoe and got a very concentrated source of scent. Now the shoes are good because they're specific for an individual. It's highly likely that anybody else would have worn those shoes, right? So you've got a very, very strong scent source 
that's specific for Teresa Horbach. And the good thing is they kept the shoes in the car. So hence, there's nobody walking around with the shoes. You sent the dog, you, you ask it to go find and fetch. And here's the important thing. Louf, she went to the van and also around Stephen Avery's garage, also around the trailer, right? Because Sarah Forsky said, oh, she wanted to go in. Now, guys, what do we know is present in Stephen Avery's trailer that Teresa Horbach touched? Who can guess it? The magazine. The magazine the and the receipt. The Auto Trader magazine. And the receipt. The Auto Trader magazine, guys. Right? So that's proof. A, proof that Teresa Horbach went to the property. And B, that her scent will be inside the trailer because she handed over an auto trader magazine to Stephen. So remember, these dogs, they've been scented. Luf has been scented to look for Teresa Horbach's scent, but she never entered into the trailer, right? She kept on going. And where she went really would have absolutely shocked the investigators and everybody. Now, just to, just to um, answer a question, it's not only blood that the blood, uh, sorry, that the cadaver dogs detect. It's not only just blood. It'll be bones, cremains, hair, skin, tissue, anything that decomposes, starts to break down, the cadaver dogs will detect. Blood that. is blood is a tissue. Blood is a tissue, and it breaks down when it's exposed to the air. Sorry, Susan. Uh, sorry, um, uh, Andy B keeps saying that he thinks that like only blood coming out of somebody that has already died no. would be detected by no, a, no, a scent. no, no, a cadaver no, dog. no, 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 it would be no, any no. blood. Correct. Any yeah. blood, because what happens is uh, your blood in your body is in an enclosed system. Blood is not normally exposed to the atmosphere, to the outside air. As soon as blood comes out of your body, it starts to decompose, it starts to break down. So hence, a, a cadaver dog will detect the scent or the smell of death, decay, breakdown doesn't have to come from a dead person. Do you understand? So that's why the dogs, the cadaver dogs hit on several vehicles in Stephen Avery's, um, in the salvage yard, because individuals were involved in accidents, bled in those vehicles, and hence the cadaver dogs detected the scent of decay. So remember, Brutus did a hit inside Stephen Avery's trailer in the bathroom. Was Stephen right. Avery dead? Was he dead? No. no. He was very much living, but his blood fell to the ground and in the sink. The cadaver dog picked it up, right? Yeah. So as soon as the blood comes out of your body, technically it starts to decay because it shouldn't be outside your body. Guys, do you agree? It should be inside your body, not outside. Right. Crockett says, what? so what's a bloodhound then, dog? A bloodhound is for scent when the person is alive, alive, as opposed to when the person is dead. Yeah, they're tracking remember, dogs. They're well known for tracking. They are, they are track. So, for example, you've got a, an escaped prisoner that runs in the woods. The dog is scented. The bloodhound is scented. They'll go find that individual. Now, you've got to understand, to Luf, does Luf know that Teresa Horbach is dead? Yes or no? No. No. Luf has got no idea. Luf is going, okay, you've given me the scent from Teresa Horbach. I'm going to go find her. I'm going to go find her where she is. Notice the difference, right? So it's a live scent tracking dog. Brutus is a cadaver dog. Brutus is not specific for Teresa Horbach. Brutus uh, detects human decomposition. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Shall we do a couple of more slides, guys? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's have a look at 14C. <laughs> now, this is going to freak you out, right? So a loof goes straight past the burn barrel. <laughs> is anybody surprised by that? <laughs> loof goes straight past Stephen Avery's burn barrel. What's where, where Teresa's it? electronics are? Where, Teresa, yes. where Teresa's electronics are. I'm not surprised yeah. at all. Now, I'm, nope. I, I, I don't even know whether Brutus um, hit on that burn barrel or not. I can't remember. I know that Brutus hit on two of the younger burn barrels, but I can't remember whether a Brutus had alerted at Stephen Avery's burn barrel. But uh, Luf just went straight past, right? Went straight mm -hmm. past. And if we can have a look at 14D, this is Stephen Avery's burn barrel, right? Where, interestingly, uh, burnt electronics were found belonging to Teresa Horbach. But my understanding is that Luf went straight past the burn barrel. Is anybody here surprised? Uh, Jack61, you had a comment. Uh, no, I'm not. You were talking about we were talking about that that barrel previous. Burn I'm barrel. not. Su yeah, I, I'm not surprised I went right past it. That with the burn barrel polka that Kratz uh, did. Well, something something weird happened with the burn barrels. I can't even, guys. I can't even study the burn barrels. I'm 100 percent confused of the burn barrels. Is anybody else confused about the burn barrels? Oh God, yes. Yeah, and, and I'm totally convinced it was intentional. Uh, yes, correct, correct. So, guys, if we can have a look at the next slide, please, Jack61. So instead of Loof hanging around uh, the salvage yard, uh, Loof decides to go past a group of pine trees and starts heading towards a cornfield. So... If we can have a look at the next slide, please, uh, Jack61. Now, remember, uh, Loof is centered for Teresa Horbach. Loof goes from Stephen Avery's trailer, which is uh, east, and goes all the way down the picked cornfield, obviously sniffing along that uh, uh, brush fence line that you can see goes all the way from the east to the west and that is about half a mile about over 800 meters so the first question you've got to ask yourself is what the hell is Luth doing going away from the Avery salvage yard going across a pit cornfield and where the hell is Luth Heading to Jack sixty one. You want to say where Loof is heading to? <laughs> the Plandenstein burial site. Yeah, correct. Loof guys is going away from Stephen Avery's trailer towards the cul de sac at Cuss Road. Now wait a second, guys. What do you see at the cul de sac? Check 61, are you at a, a blob that little picture a little bit? You can see that at the cul-de-sac of Cuss Road, there is a ton of vehicles. There is a lot of officers, detectives, all at the cul-de-sac of Cuss Road. And the immediate thing that you can see, guys, is crime scene tape. Now, wait a minute. This is weird. Loof has been centered with Teresa Horbach, the scent of Teresa Horbach. Loof is heading towards where all the action is at the cul-de-sac. Loof is thinking, her smell is saying, Teresa Horbach must be down there. Guys, do you agree? Yes or no? And people in chat, do you agree? Loof is thinking, oh my God, the smell is getting stronger towards the end of Cass Road. Alice? Yeah, I completely agree, Doc. Completely agree. And we've always said there has been there was more commotion at Cass Road than there ever was at Stevens. Correct, correct. 
But Luf is making a beeline to where all the investigators are. Luf is centered for Teresa Hallbach. Now, guys, sorry, Jack 61, did you have a comment? Oh, no, I was just going to agree. Absolutely, 100%. That's why he's heading over there. He's, he detects her. Where yes. his nose goes. Yep. Yes. The dog simply follows where the scent is. Now, the mere fact that that Luf is going east to west, doesn't stop, means that the scent must be getting stronger. Remember what Alice said? Uh, her dog sniffs around, puts its nose in the air, looks around, where is the smell? Where is it coming from? That's what Luf was doing. Luf was smelling the brush on that pig cornfield and headed straight towards the cul-de-sac of Cuss Road. You Just cannot stop. get anything more damaging than that, guys. Susan. Does Luf go all the way to the end of Cuss, out to Q or whatever it is? No. Luf stops where they are. Luf stops to where the crime scene tape is, right? Luf goes all the way down and stops there. Now, if you um, find the report, uh, Sarah Forsky wrote a report. This is known as track three in Sarah Forsky's report. Uh, the, the cadaver dog had, sorry, uh, the scent dog had multiple tracks. This is just one of them. There were multiple tracks uh, done mm -hmm. by Luke, right? This was just one of them. But don't you find it rather remarkable, guys, that Luf, who is scented for Teresa Horbach, makes a beeline straight at the end of Cuss Road, where the investigators are, where the crime scene tape is. Now, we've just proven Tom Fassbender as a bullshit artist. Because remember what Tom said, Jack 61? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, where the dog did a hit, we put our resources there. Is that true or not? That's exactly right. Right? And guess wh who came first? The investigators at Cuss Road or Luf? The investigators did because the uh, investigators. Uh, Bush, yeah, Bushman's bond. Yep. Bushman found the, the clandestine burial site in the morning. Luf didn't go there till after 1 30 p.m. That means that Fassbender told a lie in court when he said, Yeah, oh, yeah. Where the dogs give a hit, we'll allocate resources there. No, the officers were already at Cuss Road. And remember what Fassbender said, guys. Oh, we were stretched for resources. We had to be very careful where we put our, uh, our, our personnel. And yet they were there at Cuss Road. As Jack61 said, put a whole kilometer or miles of crime scene tape and the dog loop heads straight towards Cuss Road. Uh, Susan, did you have a comment? What's really interesting to me is that, let's say Stephen actually did this crime. Uh, I mean, it would be logical that he took, I mean, it would be plausible that he took Teresa <coughs> over by Cuss Road into the woods where it's private, kill her there. So why do they have to hide what happened there? And uh, they could have made it very plausible that actually Stephen did that. So, well, you know, what did they find that made it not Stephen? That, that's a very, very good point. That's a very good point. Uh, I, I, I have a potential answer. I'll say I can't prove it, but. The problem for Kratz, I think, and the, and the state was that they couldn't put Stephen over there in no way. I mean, they could, you know, circumstantially, Why I guess, not? try to, well, they could, they could okay. circumstantially, yeah, I understand what you're saying. They could circumstantially, yeah, that like whole they did everything. afternoon to himself, you know, yeah. well, he didn't go he, back to work. No, but he was around Fabian and Earl and, um, Ma. There were, yeah, there, yeah, there were phone yeah. calls. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I guess they yeah, could have potentially put him there. 
Yes, that's right. And and there were uh, he did some stuff for Jody that day. I mean, they would have had a difficult time. They could have done it, obviously, circumstantially. But but now you're. I think it would have been really difficult. I, I think it was. Uh-huh. Really, well, I mean, they sold the, they sold the a boatload of horse crap anyway. Yeah, you're, you're you're not wrong. So let me put it that way. But um, they chose this other path for whatever reason. Well, you know, Susan does bring up a good point. It's pretty obvious that they did not want to talk about Cuss Road, and they made their 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 conclusion. Their summary was that nothing took place at Cuss Road. They could have easily had built a story that um, Stephen could have done this. Yeah. But then, then you've got the big problem of Brendan Dassey. Yeah. And the narrative that Brendan said, which is in 100% contrast to Cuss Road, because Complete. according to the state, according to the state, Teresa Horbach nor her RAV4 ever left the property in fact, they contended that um, Stephen killed Teresa Horbach, well, depending on what trial you're looking at, either in his trailer or in the garage. And where did they find Ida Maffel at Cuss Road? Nope. No. Nope. Ida Maffel was found in the garage. So if they now try and build a narrative that Stephen took it to Cuss Road, um, how come nobody saw her him driving the RAV4 across the cornfield to Cuss Road. And where did the, why would he then take the vehicle from Cuss Road and put it all the way to the pit area, which no one saw? So oh, there he was going to crash it. <laughs> right. But he didn't okay. immediately, he didn't immediately crush the vehicle, even though it was daylight. So, and then, of course, you've got the Redont workers at the quarry. No one ever said, oh, yeah, I saw a RAV4 drive across the cornfield. So it's interesting. And you put up a brilliant point, Susan, why the state never went for, oh, okay, Stephen took her off the, off the property, killed her at Cuss Road, uh, somehow brought her body back back dismembered her and burnt her in his burn pit it, the whole thing doesn't make any sense so the question is and i agree with you what did they find that cuss road that proved that it wasn't stephen mm-hmm. you know and, something yeah. there's something so, there's something yeah. well yeah. you know i i'll refer back to uh fallon's reply to uh Muting and string in the September, middle of September 2006, to the to some motion that they had put forward, and this is where you know their complaint, all the complaints were, you know, they were stretched to the limit. I'm talking about law enforcement, and they went here and they went there, and Allen specifically talked about the Glendiston burial spot and finding yes. bones. He admitted, it. "I just can't. Right. I'm so I, I I think about that, and I get so worked up that muting and string." Missed that because they really could have so went after that. that. Yeah. In, in I also fact, think in, they they could have coerced Brendan to say he went to Cuss Road. They probably could have. Mm-hmm. Well, the, but the fact is, his remember uh, his brother his brother was home as well, right? And uh, Blaine. So there were people around. There were people around the property. There were people working in the uh, pits uh, on the um, quarries. There were workers there. Uh, no one ever mentions any hearing, any gunshots, nothing. So yeah. the state went with the narrative that Teresa and her RAV4 never left the property. In actual fact, the state went for the fact that the uh, Stephen and Brendan drove Teresa Horbach's RAV4 inside the garage to hide it. Mm-hmm. Right? You, If you now introduce Cuss Road, you've destroyed your own theory. You've destroyed your own hypothesis. So if they found anything at Cuss Road, they had to, do you agree? They had to bring it all back to the salvage yard to point it at Stephen. I think they did. 
I think but they you did. Know, they didn't. They didn't have that full theory on the seventh. Um, no, I don't think. Oh, I think they. I so, think it, they. I think they developed it. Of course, they didn't. Couldn't do anything with Brendan because he re- really wasn't part of the equation at that point. Of course, I mean they knew. They knew because it had already come out that you know he said he was over there on the thirty first. But y- you think about. Uh, you think about the timing of events. We've talked about it a million times. They developed it after Cuss Road. That's exactly right. After what, what they found there. That's so exactly right. So they had to find something that pointed away from Stephen. Correct. Otherwise, they would have used it. Well, you know, you, th- you think about the know. blunt. You think about the blunt and bloody object that up and disappeared out of the crime lab. So. I don't disagree with you. What else did they find that we have no idea what it is? Correct. 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 And the master architect of all this is Bushman. No question. And we'll see Uh it. So, Jack61, can we have a look at the the next slide, please? So, you've now got Louf. It's slide number 16. So, now you've got Louf, who is centered for Teresa Horbach, going straight down the cornfield away from Stephen Avery's property and going to Cuss Road, where there's a ton of investigators. Susan, would you like to continue reading, please? You bet. The dog became preoccupied with the Cuss Road cul-de-sac. Uh, quote, K-9 Loof worked this area with indications of very strong scent. K-9 Loof worked west, coming out to the cul-de-sac that was taped up with crime scene tape and two deputies were not allowing access. K-9 Loof crossed the... We'll just wait for slide 17, it's slide 17, Jack 61. Slide 17. K-9 Loof crossed the tape on one occasion and then was told to not go any further. The deputies phoned Sheriff Poggle to see if I could continue, but were told to not allow anyone access at this time. Close quote. Interestingly, Luke's nose led the bloodhound directly to the same spot that it just so happens a small group of men from the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office were already inspecting that morning. But these men were not about to let a pair of outsiders into their club. As a result, Fausk and Loof were off limits because it appeared the local police did not want them seeing what they were up to. Was evidence being mishandled or manipulated off Cuss Road? Fausk and her bloodhound weren't allowed access to the closely guarded property a half mile west of Avery's. All right. Now... This is very interesting, and I'd like to get your opinion and also people in chat. You bring in cadaver dogs, you bring in scent dogs, and Loof is going all the way down to where the crime scene tape is. Uh, Forsky, with her dog, wants to go across the crime scene tape, right? Because the whole idea is that you're detecting the scent of Teresa Horbach. The uh, officers at the crime scene tape prevent Loof from crossing the line, the crime scene tape. Now, if you're saying, okay, maybe the reason why they didn't want to do it is because of potential contamination. Well, all Forsky has to do is put on a leash on the dog, right? To prevent it running around rampant. So Loof follows where the scent is. Loof is smelling the scent of Teresa Horbach at Cuss Road, right? And Loof wants to continue past the crime scene tape. Now, why, after the officers phoned up Pagel, Pagel says, no, 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 hold the, hold the bloodhound, hold the scent dog. I don't want the scent dog in here. I can't. Tell me, I'm going to go around the panel and ask this question also in chat. If you bring in canines to help you in your investigation, why would you want to stop them 
from crossing the crime scene tape to get a closer inspection of where the dog wants to go. Why halt the dog? Alice, what's your opinion? Why would you halt that dog? Because they didn't even want the dog to found, find what they found at the clandestine burial site. Because then but, that would blow up their whole bloody case. But but according according to the official report, nothing was found there. Uh, no, I believe it was a peat, peat moss bag. A, a, a couple of pallets. <laughs> Correct. Nothing but a peat moss bag. Okay. Thank you, Alice. Uh, I don't recall. What about yourself? What would you What would you stop the dog? Because he, they didn't want it. Wouldn't fit with their theory if he smelled what what they were working on over there. So interesting. Couldn't have interesting. that. Interesting, uh, Susan. I mean, come on. He's your chance. He's your chance to nab Stephen Avery. The Bring only thing the that ball. makes. The only thing that makes sense to me with that dog is that they already found her. They knew she was there. They didn't need a dog. They found her. Why would they yeah. need a dog? Yeah, 100% correct. And they didn't want the dog or the handler to see what they found. Exactly. They wanted to keep it, they wanted to keep it incognito. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you right now, She, they found her earlier during the day. She's out of there. She's gone. They've taken it. They've taken whatever they found. It's gone. And I've got her some scent very. Isn't. <laughs> her scent is still there. What they're doing, I'll tell you what they're doing. It's only a hypothesis. They're restaging the crime scene. They're sanitizing it. Just an of opinion. Course, I, I, I'm saying a hypothesis as well. I, I don't yep. have that. It's, on only a, that. it's only a hypothesis. Thank, thank you, Susan. Jack61, why, why would you stop Lou from crossing that crime scene tape? Well, I have to agree with you because, uh, you know, once the dog and the handler cross the tape, and, and as you said, the dog could have been leashed so that there would, could be yes. no potential of destroying anything that they came, up, I came upon. They could have held it. But, you know, once the dog and the handler cross that bar barrier to where the dog is going, now you've got a witness. You've got two witnesses, actually, the dog and yes. the handler, right? Yep. And Forsky writes a report. She writes that, a report. That's right. So I agree with I, I agree with you, all of you. Yes. Uh, just Rhonda, are you there? I, I know you're muted. I, are you there? I'm not sure she's back yet, though. Okay. All right. No worries. Well, look, guys. We've done a, a lot. There's no way we can finish this one. Uh, what What do you say that we do a few more slides and we call it for today? Is everyone happy with that? Yes. Okay. All right. So let's have a look at the next slide. And this, uh, this is slide 18, Jack61. Uh, this uh, summarizes it perfectly. And there were a lot of people in chat uh, talking about this. Uh, we'll just wait for the slide to come up. It's slide number 18, Jack61. Thank you. Joined us in chat, Doc. Hi, Q. Oh, awesome. He says, I speculate, oh, let me get that back. I speculate that something fouled the Cush Road plan, hence the change of plans, and that it may have been the German man interfering with the planted evidence Hence the disappearance of evidence. You know, we honestly do not know. But on what Susan said has really now made me think even deeper. Why didn't they go with the hypothesis that Stephen brought Teresa Horbach to a cuss road and killed her there, right? Why didn't that? That obviously didn't work. So there must have been something that they found right early on, which indicated that it wasn't Stephen. It yeah. didn't work. It wasn't I, Stephen. I agree. Why? They had and to that, transfer all that evidence back over to ASY. They had, to bring it all, they had to bring it all back, and they could easily bring it all back. Now, this mm -hmm. diagram here, 
really sums it all up. So as you can see, this is the area just near the cul-de-sac of Cuss Road, where it's been extensively um, taped off with crime scene tape. And um, I don't recall, would you like to read what's underneath the slide? Can you see it? Uh, can, can a potential burial site of interest yes. to both a cadaver dog and a bloodhound located in the woods south of the end of Cuss Road, west of the scene, was photographed and examined. Nothing was recovered from this site. All right. So really, in essence, that sums it all up right there, right? All those uh, detectives... All the resources that were there for all day, that were there for the entire day, nothing was found. But I want you to take note of something very, very important. And this crystallized it for me. That area there was of interest to both a cadaver dog and a bloodhound. Yeah. And that's incredible. It's not one dog or the other, it is both of them. Now think about this. A cadaver dog detects human, human decomposition. Uh, Jack61, have you ever seen a cadaver dog find a peat moss bag and a pallet of wood? Nope. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> have you ever seen, have you With ever Teresa seen... Teresa Harbach scent. <laughs> have you ever seen a scent, a scent dog, a scent dog find a peat moss bag and a pallet of wood that's scented for Teresa Horbach. No. <laughs> no. So, guys, here we have the shenanigans exposed by the canines. You have a cadaver dog, likely Brutus, and you've got the bloodhound, uh, likely Loof, both hitting in the same area. This is an area where the investigator said nothing was found found guys you either got to be smoking crack or you need to smoke crack if you honestly believe that the investigators found nothing at cuss road and they called it in. a clandestine burial site oh yeah that's <laughs> what they called it oh yeah and they oh, were yeah. there and they were there all, all pardon day. my language all fucking day for nothing correct I don't believe it. Correct. I don't believe a word of it. Correct. And so what I'd like to do is finish with the next slide, please, because we've <laughs> we've gone for quite a long while and we've covered a hell of a lot. So this to me, when I saw this, when I read this testimony, I just couldn't believe it. And this is this is a uh, Ken Kratz. Speaking to Andrew Colburn. Now, Susan, can you please read the question, which is Ken Kratz? And uh, Jack61, Ken would you like Shager. to read the response? Do it in your best Ken Kratz voice, please. Uh, this is something that Mr. Erdl yesterday talked about a potential burial site, but what wasn't? Was that your understanding that it turned out not to be? Yeah, it turned out to be nothing. <laughs> oh, shit. That's it. Guys, he said that. guys, that's it. That's Cuss Road. That's how oh, much they God. talked about it. There was a <laughs> little bit more by Edel, which we'll talk about. But guys, have a look at the have a look at the picture up above. There are eleven vehicles there. Eleven. From, just from that picture alone, there were more that came and left, including an ambulance, which I'll talk about uh, in the next podcast, which will blow your mind. You can see the crime lab was there. There was a resource vehicle that brought in lights, powered tower lights. Uh, there's a lot of detectives down there. They blocked off the front and back of Cuss Road. They wanted to ensure that no traffic came in, no traffic came out. And Loof went up to the crime scene tape and was prevented from crossing the crime scene tape. <clears throat> Pagel said, nope, don't allow them to cross. All right? Both dogs, now, right? 
the dogs not allow them to cross. Now, Fassbender cried in court saying, look, we were so stretched with resources, we had to be very careful, right? We, oh, we, you know, the salvage yard was a huge place. But what he didn't tell was that these guys were already at Cuss Road before the dogs even got there, right? Before the yep. dogs even got there. So that means that Bushman found something so significant that all these guys showed up. Hey, guys, I found something. Now, remember, back then, and I agree with Susan, oh, my God, you hit, you hit the mark. Back then, they didn't know what happened to Teresa Horbach, right? They had no idea. They were suspicious of Stephen Avery. And we can prove it because on November the 5th, the three amigos, Lenk, Colburn, Remica, were already playing crime scene detective detectives in Stephen Avery's trailer. They detected lots of blood. They collected the blood. Suddenly, on November the 7th, Bushman finds a clandestine burial site. Now, let me, let me ask the panel this question. Bushman is not a young guy. He's been around the trap. And did you know that Bushman was one of the arresting officers of Stephen Avery back in 1985? Yep. Uh, yeah, he sure, he sure was. Now, Bushman was semi-retired, not permanently, but semi-retired. Bushman is MTSO. Under Kassar, he was for many Kassurik, years. And with Kassarik, with Kassarik for many, many years. Out of the blue, out of all the hundreds of officers at their disposal, they call Bushman. And Bushman only comes in for how many days, Jack 61? How many days does he come in? One day. Um, one, one day. And is Bushman ever called to, um, to testify? No. At a trial? No. No. Does Bushman write a report? Not a single word. And Bushman's He didn't even name- sign out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wait to don't worry. I did. I deep dived into that okay. one. I'm, I'm doing a mystic. I'm doing a mystic jinx now. You, it'll blow your mind what happened. But we'll do that in the next podcast. Bushman never gets called to testify, right? He doesn't write a report, and I think his name is mentioned three times out of the whole Queso report. Bushman clearly is an extremely important person. Now. Yes or no? Bushman, he knows Stephen Avery. Bushman is MTSO. Would you say that Bushman is loyal to Kasserik or Stephen Avery? What would uh, you say? Oh, Kasserik, for sure. Kasserik. He is a disciple. Yeah, he is a disciple of Tom Kasserik. Yeah. Now, this is going to blow your mind. Did you know that Bushman was a dog handler? I did know that. Yeah. He's a, yeah, he's a canine yeah. officer. Yeah. He was part of a canine unit. And I wonder whether he brought a dog with him. How on earth, think about it, guys. How on earth do they stumble across a clandestine burial site in the middle of a forest? Well, I'd ask that, question, I'd ask that question the other day because I found a reference to uh, yes. Man- Manitowoc saying that they brought our dogs. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I, it, yes. It, it didn't say specifically, you know, but yes. it, for me, I took that reference as coming from Manitowoc. Now, isn't that interesting? And there's another couple of other very interesting things as well. Well, look, guys, I like to hold it here because we have covered a hell of a lot. And I hope, guys, that you've learned a lot uh, on the panel. I have and in chat. But look look what we've done. We've gone over the dogs, how they work, the two different types of dogs, the cadaver dogs, the scent dogs, the bloodhounds, how their nasal system works, 
how they're engineered to detect smells, the fact that the dogs were brought on the property, the fact that I believe Remica lied about him not being with the dog. Of course he was. There's no way that Deedring is going to make two mistakes in an official report. We've looked at the pre-trial testimony of Tom Fassbender. He had no idea about the dogs. We looked at Remica as well. And then we introduced Loof and what Loof did. And now we're at the position whereby Loof is now at Cuss Road where the police tape is. So what we're going to do in next week's podcast, we'll continue this and now have a look at even more shenanigans and bring it all together to show you that, and I agree with Susan, they found something at Cuss Road that didn't point to Stephen, that scared the shit out of them. And they had to bring everything from Cuss Road back to Stephen Avery's property. And it was easy to do, guys. Easy. And I'll even tell you how they did it and where they went. Because the dogs, the cadaver dogs and the scent dogs, they had hyper hits along certain ridge lines, right? And you're thinking, oh my God, that's how they got in. They got in very easily and got out very easily. And it's so scary. So guys, this goes to show the power of using the canines and how disingenuous it was that the investigators trivialized their findings. Remember, guys, what did Tom Fassbender say? The theory. The theory. Instead of saying, yeah, it's a fact, of course they're highly trained, he said that the theory of detecting blood and cadavers. Unreal. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, guys. And thank you for all the readers for the excellent reading. Thank you so much for everyone in chat. I hope that you've enjoyed the podcast. We'll be back next week. But I'd like to quickly go around the panel. How are you coming along? Uh, Alice, what about yourself? Yeah, not too bad, Doc. As I say, it's a wee bit of pain in that. I've got, uh, had some dental um, yeah. procedures this week. So, uh, and I've got some more next week as well. So, and I'm terrified to the dentist. So, that's a yeah, huge thing for me to do as well. So, um, but yeah, um, not too happy. Um, there's new stuff came out in Luke's case. Oh. Um, we have actually found out they have destroyed 1,600 items, including oh clothing um, and things like that. Um, we've also found out that there has been 10, 10 bodily fluid swabs that was took off of Jodie's body from her cheek, her breast, her abdomen, her hands, um, that have never been tested. They've never no, been tested? They've never been tested. Um, and what else was it? Uh, the defence and that was always told that they took only scrapings from one of Jodie's hands. Well, they have now found out that they did take it from both of the hands. Oh. <laughs> it's another horror oh. case. That's yes. another yes. horror case. So, I mean, this has all just came out over the last few weeks. Um, I did post a... I think I posted an article in the uh, Jodie, Jodie and Luke's room in Discord and Sandra and Scott have just done a new video um, with, um, oh God, I can't even remember their name. Uh, and I've posted that in the room as well. Um, so okay. if you want to know about that, you should check it out. there. Yeah, definitely. So um, very, very angry at the moment, Doc, because... This is a serious miscarriage of justice in Scotland, not just a miscarriage of justice. They have stolen the life of a 14-year-old child 
because they couldn't be bothered their arse to investigate fucking properly and a 14 year another 14 year old child who was brutally murdered who's not got justice you know so there's some very angry scots at the moment going about when it comes imagine. to the Luke's case i could imagine I could imagine. And, uh, you know, like I said, here we are deep diving into the Stephen Avery, Brendan Dassey case. We are peeling that onion layer piece by piece. That's what's got to be done with the Luke Mitchell case, piece by piece. Yeah. But what they've done is they've discarded all the forensic evidence. They yeah. do not want to request it. And now you know why, right? Yeah. Same with the Daniel Bosclaw case. They don't want to give the pants. They don't want to MVAC it. They don't want to do nothing because they're too embarrassed and ashamed of all the shit that they carried out. Here, at least with this case, we can see the shenanigans taking place because the dogs led us to the shenanigans and we're peeling that onion layer piece by piece. Plus, we've got a lot of documents that are, we've got in the foul play library that we can read and take apart. And now we can see uh, the whole shenanigans that took place. It's disgusting. It's yeah. disgusting. And you could yeah. tell, even by Susan asking that strategic question, well, why did they go for Cuss Road? There had to be a, there had to be a reason, right? Same with the Luke Mitchell case. Why did they do this and this and this? They're too scared to find the answer. Yeah, but let's hope, let's hope some resolution takes place, Alice. I really well, do. we hope we we hope so, Doc. I mean, Luke's got a, a legal team in that who's fighting for them, and the prosecutors are actually they're actually terrified at the moment because Luke could sue the pants off them. I mean, that was one of the headlines um, in one of the articles um, that was going about lately is that. Um, prosecutors are hoping that Luke doesn't sue. Well, to be honest, I hope to God that they sues the pants off them. Yeah, he, no. He, he's too. He needs yeah, to. Yeah, he, he, he does, Doc. He does. So, but thanks, Doc. Thank you so much, Alice. What about yourself? I don't recall. How are things coming along? I'm really angry right now after listening to her. Um, what she just said. Wow. There needs to be consequences for that. Like letting the person go, you know? Correct. They would learn not to do that, you know? Right. Ah, makes you so yep. angry. It does. Um, and... Mm -hmm. But you see the same thing in so many cases, right? In this particular case, they gave away all the cremains, right? Um, and Lord knows yeah. what other evidence is out there that they, they're withholding or you don't know about. Photographs, Jack61 will tell you, there are photographs that we don't have. Uh, and uh, Ertl, Ertl was there. Ertl was at the clandestine burial site. But Ertl, as you'll see, came too late. It was done deliberately. It was another coroner job. Right, so thank you. Yeah. I don't any That's any me. other comments. No, no, just mm -hmm. uh, thanks for me. Just working on you know with Rhonda whenever I can on Daniel's case and trying to keep up with this. What what uh, you know what you guys are doing. So that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much. I don't recall. Uh, next we have Susan. How are you coming along? I'm good, Doc, but uh, I'm so frustrated. The, the Luke Mitchell case, the Stephen Avery case, the Daniel Holtzcock case, there's, it's so frustrating. What, it is very frustrating. That they hide stuff and do not allow the truth to be told. No. It just no. it's, it just makes me so angry. <laughs> I mean, guys in chat, guys on the panel, the dogs told the truth. No one was listening. The dogs told the truth. No one is listening. It's as simple as that. And don't worry, the next podcast is, is going to get even more spicier. The stuff that this, I found out and put together is just like, what the hell? <laughs> Susan. This is this has been excellent, Doc. You've, you've done a, a super job. Thank you so much for all your effort. Thank you. And Neverly too. She helped as well. But she could be Neverly, here today. Yes. But yes. Uh, I, really, I must admit, I really do. I uh, love deep diving and putting things together. I did a Mystic Jinx because I know that Mystic Jinx also likes deep diving on certain things. But because we've been at this game for many, many years, because we've done hundreds of podcasts, we can see the connections now. We can see where it all fits. 
and the dogs led the path. As soon as I read this chapter, I knew I had to expand what uh, John Farrak did. There's no way he could have encapsulated all of this in his chapter. He could have written a book about it. But I think that we're, we're heading in the right direction here and it all come together quite nicely at the end. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you for your reading as well. And finally, we have uh, Jack61. What a chapter so far. And this expanded part, Doc, you and Everly have knocked it out of the park. I mean, out Thank of the park. So it, it's fantastic. And I, I have to agree, Susan, um, she poised a, a perfect question. She really did. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I'm going to try to resist to peeking at the rest of the slides. And <laughs> I'm, I'm just I'm going to put it aside till next week. Uh, awesome. for yeah, for, for tomorrow, the open mic, we're going to go back into some dispatch calls and maybe even tie in a little bit of uh, the dispatch uh, calls to some of what we're talking about now. Maybe a little bit. There, there, there's really not a lot of conversation about, you know, Great Lakes Search and Rescue uh, or, or really much of the dogs at all. There is a little bit. Like I said, there's one. I don't know if we'll get to it tomorrow. But we might. There is one call with Poggle talking about uh, going to pick up the these shoes, but um uh, Anyway, that's what we're going to do tomorrow. We're going to head back into some dispatch awesome. calls and maybe uh, spark up some conversation. And, um, yeah, can't wait till next week. Thanks, awesome. everyone. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Well, look, guys, I hope that you've enjoyed the podcast, uh, the Foul Play team. We're delighted to present it. Um, it's amazing, all this information. It's been out there for years but it's a matter of putting it all together and putting a, a nice narrative, a nice wrap around it so it makes perfect sense. And again, the damning thing is uh, the documents are there, right? The dogs told a particular story, and I think we're slowly teasing it out, but it gets much worse, much worse in the next podcast or two. But guys, if you like what we've done, uh, please subscribe, consider subscribing. Give us a thumbs up if you've enjoyed the podcast and share, right? Share, share our, uh, our website, our YouTube channel, our Discord channel, share it. The more people we can get, the more people that can ask strategic, tough questions, the better. And that's fantastic. All right, guys, I'd like to thank everyone in chat. We had an excellent crowd, lots of excellent questions. We will hopefully... See you, well, tomorrow and for next week to continue reading with the crew series. My name is Dr. Silkman. And I'm from the Foul Play team. Welcome. And this has been Foul Play Production.